My name is Anna Badcock. I'm the Cultural Heritage Manager for the Peak District National Park. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Peak District National Park and Derbyshire County Council. Um, me and my colleagues extend a really warm welcome to you all. We're thrilled so many of you could join us today. We've had um, 500 people register for each session, which is fantastic. So we're delighted to welcome you all. We particularly say a a uh, warm welcome to friends joining us from overseas. We've reached New Zealand, Canada, Sweden, France, several other countries too. So um, you're all really welcome. It's great to see you. It's a very special year for us this year. We're celebrating the 70th birthday of the Peak District National Park. And we're also celebrating 200 years of the birthday of Thomas Bateman, who many of you will know was an extraordinary 19th century collector and antiquarian, and he excavated more than 200 Bronze Age barrows in Derbyshire and the Peak District. So we're celebrating those two events and a huge thank you to everybody who's donated to our fundraising campaign to do some repairs to Bateman's tomb. And we'll be circulating links to that fundraising website at the end as well. So big thank you if you've already supported us in that. We're very pleased to bring you Derbyshire Archaeology Day digital in 2021. It's not what we'd planned last year, but we're excited by the new format. We hope it works for you. Bear with us. The technology is new for us too, so we're hoping there aren't any glitches, but we'll try to get through any if there are. So we're hoping it works for you too. There's a little bit of interactivity in terms of a few polls that we've got for some questions later as well. So we hope that all works. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, so if you want to expand the screen to sort of remove all your browser tabs at the top, there's a couple of arrows top right. You can click to expand your screen. There is a chat function in the top right hand corner also. So we will be taking questions after each talk. If you do have a question, please feel free to pop it in the chat. The chat is private, so um, the speakers and the hosts, we will see those questions, but they won't be visible to the um, rest of the audience. There are several hundred of you here today, so we may not get a chance to answer all your questions, but we'll do our very best with that. So please feel free to use that chat function throughout the talks and I'll gather the, the questions as we go along. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to my colleagues, Steve and Natalie. Um, they'll be your hosts for the rest of the session. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. And um, yeah, I'll hand. Hello, I'm Steve Baker. I'm the archaeologist for Derbyshire County Council. And I'm Natalie, oh, now, sorry, I'm Natalie Ward and I'm the archaeologist. Sorry, go on, the Natalie. Senior... I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh, I'm Natalie Ward. I'm the senior conservation archaeologist at the Peak District National Park Authority. Now, down in the south of Derbyshire, in the village of Ticknell, we're very lucky that we've got one of the very best local community archaeology groups in the region, uh, if not in the country, in the Ticknell Archaeological Research Group, or TARG. Their knowledge is encyclopedic, their fieldwork is meticulous, their commitment to getting the results out in the public domain is, is exemplary, and they punch well above their weight in terms of research output. So I'm delighted to welcome Sue Brown to talk about one of their recent projects. Sue, are you there? Am I about to start? We are I indeed. I shall, I shall disappear. I can't get full it. screen. Oh, God, where's it gone? Ah, that's all right. I've got it. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So I can, I can start then. You may start. Thank you, kind. Right. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Steve. Um, the title of this talk is Unravelling the Myth of Martin Camp Flasks, the evidence from an excavation at Staunton Lane End, Ticknell. Now, just in case anyone is still unsure where Ticknell is in this part in Derbyshire, it's in the deep south down here with the uh, red circle around it. 
However, I'm going to start by describing the pots known as Martin Camp flasks, as they are quite rare and why they are significant as an archaeological find. Then move on to the Ticknell connection and how the excavation at Staunton Lane End comes in. So what is a Martin Camp flask? These are two complete flasks, one from Dieppe Castle Museum and the other from the Museum of London. They are a rounded gourd-like bottle or flask with a spout. If you look more closely, it is rather odd. It doesn't stand up and the throwing rings run towards the spout, shown more clearly on this example on the right. Usually the throwing rings, which are made when the potter raises the pot, run from the base to the top, which is clearly not the case here. There are no handles and they are unglazed. So how did the potter make this rather odd pot? The, they were wheel thrown by the potter who threw a pot in the normal way and cl then closed off the top of the pot while it was still turning on the wheel. This often let, left a pimple on the outer surface and a very distinctive tight swirl on the inside. You can see the stresses the clay was under here. A hole was then cut in the side of the pot, the edges smoothed and a separately spoon, thrown spout attached on the outside. It was not possible to reach inside. It was left to dry until leather hard, then the original base was trimmed, so it was rounded. And this one was rounded, but it's slumped, so it's quite flat. And this shows you the spout fixing from the inside. And it's, it's moved off and it's going across those throwing rings. And on the outside, we can't tell where it's fixed. Because the flasks were quite fragile, they were often encased in wicker, as in this example from the Mary Rose, which sunk in 1545 and which is a remarkable survival. This would also enable a flat base to be incorporated in the wicker so it could be stood up. And so how was it used? Well, here we have similarly shaped vessels, but these are glass because it's early 14th century, uh, so well before these flasks were produced but they've been they're drinking out of them nothing changes this is the original tin can and the tobacco rasp on the left shows a rather more refined use of a similar pot used for drawing off wine from the barrel and with a wicker casing it could the flask could also be taken on to the field or as in the mary rose example shows taken on board ship the classification of these types of pots was done by John Hurst from the 1960s onwards. They were believed to be an import from Northern Europe, specifically the hamlet of Martin Camp in Normandy, hence the name. Although pottery has been made at Martin Camp for several centuries, there's been no production site identified nor for any flasks. Hurst's definitions include two shapes. Type 1, which is at the top here, flattened on one side, and type 2, a more rounded shape. And as well as this, he identified three main fabric types, pale to buff, orange and grey purple, and associated them with specific periods, so they've often been used for dating, and here are Hearst's dating. Now, I'm going to move on to the Ticknell connection, which is really what it's about. In the late 1990s, Alan McCormick, who was curator of the Brewhouse Yard Museum in Nottingham, told us that in the 1970s, he had helped to retrieve several bags of potsherds after work had been done on this cottage, including several pieces of Martin Camp flasks. They were taken to Derby Museum, where they live in seven boxes. We went and saw them shortly afterwards and took some not very good photographs, and we had to go back, of course. Several years later, in 2007, we went to see Alan Vince in Lincoln um, as part of our research on Ticknell pottery for cer ceramic analysis. And this was a throwaway remark of his. We told him we thought we had a site in Ticknell that might be making them, but unfortunately he didn't live much longer. So we weren't able to follow that up. In, in 2013, we started to research these pots more seriously. Um, that when Anne Irving, Janet Spavald and myself decided we needed to see what other museums had Martin Camp flasks and were they Ticknell? TARG had been formed in 2010 and we're in a better position to investigate if the opportunity arose. 
This map by Pierre Ekowix shows the finds from the 1980s onwards, which supports the coastal distribution. He also suggested eight different fabrics, as well as casting doubt on the Martin Camp attribution, where to date a production site has still not been found. We went to the museums of London and Southampton, and we took a spout from Ticknell, which was kindly loaned by Derby Museum, this little one down here. Uh, standing against a similarly coloured one, but this one's much smoother, ours is a bit rougher. And then we went to, across the water to Dieppe, where they've got some nice Martin Camp flasks as well, and where Pierre Ekowicz is the curator. And then in 2014, the last tenant of the cottage in Ticknell passed away, and the cottage became reno vacant before renovation. Here is the cottage garden in April. It was never a garden as such. Targ was given permission to do some test pits and we were told only to take a small sample. By the time we excavated though in this garden, the vegetation was up to the windows. We made a plan as you do. It's a very odd shaped site with plenty of obstacles. It stands on the coal measures clay and uh, there's an oil tank down here, a cesspit in the other corner, the pigsties over here with the outside loose, and then there is there's a manhole cover here and possible electricity and gas. We were, nobody was sure where anything was apart from the, the three obvious things. We were allowed to dig on the south side to start with, and it, this is the narrower bit with huge overhanging trees. The ground was bone dry. The whole site stood 75 centimetres above the surrounding fields. And we aimed to find a pot tip and hopefully a kiln. Now, before we leave this, this part of the cottage to the left was built in the 1790s. This wall was 1600s, probably. This is a wash house and this is the 1918 extension and this is where we put the test bits and we're concentrating on two three four and six here although we found quite a lot of pots in some of the others as well and here we are digging this you can tell this is quite early in the excavation because the sp spoil heaps are very low uh, later on we could hardly see anything there was virtually nowhere to put any spoil heap at all this is test pit two, then three. They'd yielded quite a lot of pots. They seemed to be mostly clay. And we wondered whether we'd hit the clay heap. of a wall running parallel with the cottage. The clay on the left of this wall went down to 70 centimetres. On the right, there were several tumbled bricks and pot sherds on top of more clay. In trench three, this was offset from trench two, and this photo here on the left, the wall footings have reappeared in line with those in trench two. There was solid clay in the middle with a small pit that had been dug into it. On the right, the clay was taken out and it went down to 70 centimetres where there were rocks. But it's such a small area, it was difficult to make any sense of this. And right down underneath the ranging pole at that edge, there were pot sherds in the clay. So uh, what were they doing there? Going on here. However, trench four with all those obstacles seem to have struck gold. These in the bowl here are Martin Camp spouts and it looks like the pot tip. Cut by the main sewage the pipe, which of course didn't run to the manhole cover. It ran from the bathroom put in in 1976 
through an earlier run of land drains straight to the cesspit. Although a huge amount of potsherds came out of this trench, it had obviously been very disturbed and was probably the source of many of the surface pots all over the site and Derby Museum's pots. We decided to extend the trench to one side, uh, this would be trench six, to hopefully find something that avoided all drains and other disturbance. And trench six, as you can see, was absolutely full of potsherds once you got past the hard pan of soil and this is soil and pots, but down here in 603, there's masses and masses of potsherds all wedged together very tightly with voids and loads of small kilny gritty bits, but there was no soil. And right down at the bottom, there was uh, solid pots. They'd been pushed into soft clay and this had been and probably still was on the water table, which had got wet and dried out repeatedly. And it was like digging concrete. It went down for 10 centimetres further before it hit the natural. As we went down in the trench, the packed in flask shapes became clearer. The majority of our sherds, though, were rather small, the pots being very fragile. However, we did get some really good wasters like this one, which was two pots fused together. This is a decent size. The trench, this trench seemed untouched and a secure context with lots of flash sherds and most importantly, the wares made with them because nobody ever dated their pots in Ticknell. So when you put a graph of these pots on a graph, um, it gives you an idea of what's contained in this small trench. I shall return it to later, but note the large predominance of bottle sherds and I shall say later why, while I'm calling them bottle sherds. A few statistics. Our small sample amounted to a huge number of Ticknell bottle sherds, over 5,000, and over 33,000 sherds of all sorts in all. And here's a pretty picture of uh, some of our 126 spouts. So at least 126 of these uh, uh, bottles tipped out. Our spouts are between 5 to 8 centimetres in length, but mostly in the 6 to 7.5 range. So they're quite short and stumpy with a neat little rim and fired almost to stoneware. Anne Irving thinks that they all seem to be the work of one potter. So we tried to put some together. Although we have found so many sherds of the flasks, it is almost too much. Many are small triangular pieces which could fit anywhere. The spouts we have retrieved don't fit any of the body pieces we've been able to fit together. There are vital bits missing, of course. This misshapen body is missing a base part and a spout. And this construction is the base side of a flask. It looks to be a flattened shape, perhaps a type 1. This one is the, part, is the original top of a spout. You can see the very nice throwing rings here. It's got its little pimple where it's closed off. But with this one, we were able to roughly gauge the capacity of the original pot with Janet's hands supporting it under the gaps and me placing a plastic bag filled with two pints of water inside with the base attached, it would easily hold the two pints. But when we came to classify them by colour, we had real problems as they do not altogether fit with Hearst's descriptions. We not only have cream, not very many of those, but we have buff, orange, red, grey and purple. But the colours change from buff to orange on the same piece of pot. Orange to grey, orange to dark red, grey to purple and so on. One part of a pot may be a different colour to another, adding to the problems. This is probably because the Ticknell clays are mostly iron rich with lots of quartz inclusions. Ticknell potters were known to mix the clays. The 1924 geological map shows at least 12 different coloured clays within a mile of the site. And these flasks or bottles are made from Ticknell clay. We had some chemical analysis done on the sherds, thank you Derbyshire County Council, which placed them firmly in the Ticknell clays. Similar to the composition of our Midland purple, but slightly different. They've done something to the clay as well as cleaning it more, and they're quite light. The kilns that these potters were using were not that far removed from the medieval ones that Newell was referring to with this statement. And our potters would have had little control over the atmosphere in the kiln. 
We also wondered whether the pots were where the pots were stacked in the kiln, perhaps in a cooler or hotter area, might also have contributed to the variations in colour. These next two slides show a piece of original flask with a fresh break going from the lighter colours to the dark. So here we've got orange on the left and buff on the right. And then we've got uh, grey over here and purple. They do look a bit similar, just sort of more cooked to my eyes, but then I'm no expert. Now, the distri dis unexplained distribution of Martin Camp flasks in the Midlands noticed by Alan Vince could easily be from Ticknell, as the next few slides will indicate. Firstly, the archaeological evidence provides the early indication of where Ticknell pots in general got to. Ticknell made some very distinctive wares in the late 1400s and 1500s before any documentary evidence exists, and these are probably the reason it got its name. The jug from Lincoln was found in the Bishop's Palace dissolution deposit. Cistercian at Codner Castle, Home and Abbey in Shropshire and Austin Friars in Leicester. The little Tudor heads are probably from chafing dishes. We have 21 off pot sites and another 10 from field walking and three more were found at this dig. And this is all before uh, documentary evidence. Once we get documentary evidence in the shape of probate inventories, they become common from the mid 1550s, but it takes several decades before detailed descriptions of earthenware become frequent. Even then, less than 10% of earthenware references might give where the pots originated from, such as Tickney pots, Ticknell mugs, Boston jugs, and so on. We have looked at every probate inventory for Leicestershire, which that's why they are, uh, it's a different colour, and Buckinghamshire. And there's some typical, typical Ticknell pots around the edge. And we've got several references to bottles. From 1589 to 1695. This, as well as the fact we've got provenance, is why we've called them Ticknell bottles or tea bots. Their contemporaries called them bottles, and they are currently, in modern day parlance, Martin Camp flasks. It is the only site in Ticknell where production seems to have taken place. But it should be remembered that potters were paid for their waste to put on the roads, gateways, and footpaths. And we're extremely lucky that it survived for us to find, particularly as it was partially undisturbed and it was the only undisturbed bit that we had in the whole dig. And this next slide is these documentary references on a map and it includes the archaeology references which we have. Over here at Bingham, where a very thorough field walking survey has been done of the parish. I think it was a spout that was found. Wingerworth, where one was found, a complete one was found in a coal mine. Nottingham, where one was found from the castle, in the castle well, and three complete ones from the castle inn, with sealed glass bottles with a 1650 date. Another spout was found in the Nottingham caves. We did hope to have at least a photo of one of these for this talk, but unfortunately, thanks to the virus, we've not been able to do that. They took them around on the usual methods, on their back in crates, horse and cart, pack horses, and possibly down the river. So how do we know what sort of date these are? Well, if we go back to Hearst dating on the left with his type, three types, and our numbers of sherds, our graph of sherds from Trench 6, the fact that there's a large amount of Midland Purple stroke blackware, which is uh, developing from the Midland Purple, which is still there in quite a bit of quantity, brown glazed earthenware, Midland yellow, um, this would suggest to us that it is probably the first half of the 17th century. That's as near as we can get. But we do have a potter for this site. Thomas Morley died in 1658 and he made these bottles. The documentary evidence suggests that bottles were being made both earlier and later than the dates he was working. A potter for early the early bottles is unknown. 
but the later 17th century bottles would have been Thomas Morley, his son, who died in 1698. He would have learnt his skills from his father. We would suggest that Martin Camp finds, especially in the Midlands, really do need to be considered as to whether they are ticknal, as it may well affect results if they are used for dating, or used as an indicator of foreign trade, when it may be trade with ticknal. Likewise, we would be interested in knowing the wider area over which our bottle sherds must be spread. We know there was transport down the Trent, so they could have gone anywhere. So what did we find? We found the house platform built up deliberately. It was not the clay heap. This became obvious when the underpinning was done later on. We found the pot tip, but we did not find the pot kiln, which may have been at least partly under the 1980 extension. The wall footings we found appeared to have supported a structure that was fixed along above the ground floor windows where there was a long row of small holes and perhaps it was an open-ended drying shed. There was no return. We had found a production site for Martin Camp flasks or Technol bottles. Not only that, but although other places were making these flasks, we're not claiming a unique, unique site, a spout in a brill fabric has been found and a cargo of earthenware wicker bottles were noted as being transported from Newcastle to Boston in about 1600. But this is the first production site found for this type of ware anywhere. It's another first for Derbyshire and Ticknell. And as hopefully has it been apparent, we couldn't have done it without the help of those mentioned on this slide. So thank you very much. And of course, We've written it up and if you would like to know more um, and would like a copy of our publication, please contact targ.sec at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Ooh, gone over. That's it. Sue, that's brilliant. Um, many apologies to anybody who had, who had problems with sound dropping out during that. We don't know why that was. Um, no. We're glad that you came back, Sue. Um, that really illustrates how work in a small Derbyshire village can have um, national or even international research value. Um, and thank you very much. Um, Anna, I wonder if we've got any questions for Sue? We do. We've got three questions so far. Yeah. Um, the first is, this came earlier on. Sue, in your talk, why were the flasks made in this way instead of putting the spout at the top of the turning clay? Don't know. They're much more difficult to make. Hmm. Curious. Okay. That's an interesting conundrum. <laughs> There's a second question which is asking, was there any geophysical survey done to the area before you did your excavations? That would be rather difficult. Um, it was a very small area. It was less than uh, two metres wide, virtually. So uh, it wasn't really possible. Right. Thank you. We've had another, first of all, a um, compliment. This is excellent work, meticulous and methodical. Well done. Can you tell us Thank more you. about TARG and also if a report has been published? Well, that's just been answered, I think. Um, what are the future research questions that need to be investigated? Well, I can tell you about TARG. We, we were founded in 2010 um, with an HLF grant for three years. Um, and we're still going simply because there has been more to do. That we shall be running out eventually. But um, our latest current uh, excavation is in, in doubt that it will continue. So because of changed circumstances. Right. But, uh, you know, we, we've investigated as many pot sites as we can in the area, but uh, eventually we will run out. We were, we were set up specifically to investigate the potteries. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I've had another question. How easy or hard would they be to drink out of? Were they corked? Uh, well, they must have had a plug in them. Mm. Um, but... Uh, you know, I have no idea. I don't. No, nobody has tried drinking out of it <laughs> because the, ones, the, the Museum of London did do some capacity tests for us. On um, they've got some very nice ones which we didn't see, some complete ones. 
and they very kindly did some capacity tests on one of them or, t or all of them i think and uh, but they did it with rice because it was dry and it wouldn't harm the the flasks so unless somebody's going to actually reproduce one of those flasks in the same sort of way and try drinking out of it you know <laughs> but uh yeah okay. that's as much as we can tell yeah, you thank you and a, a really? couple of people have asked about the contents actually whether we know what was inside them liquid but we don't <laughs> know more than that so whether it was not really no no not really thank you that's all the questions um i've had in through the chat steve thank you very much sue um moving on to our second talk now um we're told that the the course of true love never did run smooth and the same could probably be said for post -ex. um those of you with with long memories may recall about 10 years ago we had a talk from a, a very young ian miller of oxford archaeology north about a freshly dug medieval site in derby at bold lane and I remember blithely inviting in to come back and, and present the, the post-ex results. Uh, little did I expect it would be a decade hence. Um, but good things come to those who wait. And, and I was delighted when the final report for this landed on my desk late last year. And I think it illustrates that sometimes the story comes not immediately out of the dig, but, but later on through the careful work of specialists. So I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome Richard Gregory of Oxford Archaeology North to talk about it. And I'm hoping Richard is here. Richard, are you there? I'm not hearing anything. Richard, do you have your mic switched on? <laughs> I think he is making a cup of tea. Shall we switch um, over or will that not work from a scheduling point of view, Steve? Have we got, have we got Chris here? sent a message hello can you hear me hello is that richard yeah, yeah, sorry i don't know what's happened there hello can you hear me i sir? just i just gave you a, an, an amazing build-up and, and then it all went well, quiet that, well you know that might be the best bit of the talk we'll have to see <laughs> <laughs> anyway i'll try that again we're, we're delighted to welcome richard gregory from oxford archaeology north over to you richard okay thank you very much steve and um Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, if there's any of you out there. Um, as Steve said, my name's Richard, and today I'm actually broadcasting live from Wally Range, Manchester, which are otherwise known as the uh, lockdown capital of England. Um, now, we've actually been in lockdown for so long here in Manchester, we've lost track of what season it is. But I'm looking at the moisture dripping down my window and I think it might be winter um, but anyway I hope lockdown is treating you all kindly and that everyone's well and healthy and as Steve said the reason I'm with you this afternoon is that um, he's asked me to speak about an archaeological excavation funded by Derby City Council and completed by Oxford Archaeology close to the centre of Derby which has produced some excellent information on the medieval town and the lives of its townspeople. Um, now, let's see, go on. Yeah. Now, before I begin, I thought I'd just let you know who Oxford, Archaeo Ar Ar Oxford Archaeology is. You might be wondering why we're actually in Derby. Um, well, we've been knocking around for about 45 years now, and I think we're actually one of the largest archaeological practices in the UK and we were primarily engaged in commercially funded archaeology and we also do community outreach projects and the one thing about us we might be a commercial unit but we are very focused on research and we're trying to 
we always try and advance knowledge about the past by maximizing the research potential of the sites that we excavate. And then we try and make this knowledge accessible to the public through various forms of media. Um, and one of these is why I'm here today speaking to you. Um, now, we're actually a national organisation. So we've got three offices in Oxford, Cambridge and Lancaster. And I work for the Lancaster office and we specialise in the archaeology of northern Britain. But we also wander further south occasionally. Um, we do quite a few projects in the Midlands, and that's why we were we found ourselves in Derby. Um, now, the site I'm going to talk about is occupied by uh, a recently erected building, which is known as Sadler Bridge Studios, um, which is close to the centre of Derby, which you can see on these maps here. Um, so it's just southwest of the council offices. And it's a short walk north of the, the, the museum. Um, now, it was previously occupied by a supermarket. I mean, some of you may know, you might have bought a loaf of bread there. I'm not sure, but that was demolished uh, in order to construct these new studios. Um, now, the studios themselves are set within a large square area. With the, you've got the former council offices at the center. And it's actually bounded by four major medieval streets, uh, which formed quite an important element of the later medieval town that existed following the Norman conquests, so after 1066. So we got St Mary's Gate to the north, which is probably named after the lost church of St Mary's, which we don't actually know where that is anymore. There's Iron Gate to the east, which may have had a connection with iron working. Sadler Gate to the south, which the name implies there was some connection with leather working, and Bold Lane to the west. So our site is located on Sadler Gate next to the junction of Bold Lane. Now, just to give you a little bit more historical background, we basically think that uh, the later medieval town emerged out of an earlier medieval settlement, which we know was called Northworthy. Um, and it could possibly be somewhere around the church of St. Altman's up north, around King Street, Queen Street, although we don't really, really know for sure. Um, what we know is that after the Norman conquest, Derby then formed a major market town. And so it gets its first charter in 1154. And then he has a second charter in 1204. And it was also quite an important ecclesiastical centre. And we can see this, it's got a scatter of early churches and monastic houses. Now, I think the, the extent and form of the later medieval town, you can work it out by looking at some of the early historical town plans, which date to the late 16th and 17th centuries. Now, John Speed's map of the town, right there on the left, dating to 1610, is quite useful. It's the earliest map to show the complete extent of the town. And it shows the four medieval streets that I've just mentioned. Uh, which surround our site, which is there highlighted in red, and that of Sadler Gate, where our site lies. Um, now, that map indicates by, by at least the 17th century, the area defined by the four streets, they contain properties along all of, the, all of the street frontages, and some of these were presumably medieval, or at least occupied the sites of medieval buildings. Now, the properties, they would have lain in what we call burgage plots, which are basically small parcels of urban land occupied by the town's inhabitants or the, or the burgesses. Now, we, have, we do have another map, actually, um, slightly earlier than John Speed's, which dates to 1599. Uh, it's there. That's actually a copy of it. Um, it was made by an unknown cartographer, and it, I think there's a copy of it presently in Chatsworth House somewhere. Um, 
Now, although the scale of that is, is quite imprecise, when you try and fit it with modern mapping, it suggests that our site, in that red box there, covered two of the Burgage plots, which fronted Sadler Gate, uh, and three of the more compact plots on Bold Lane. Now, those smaller plots, they're probably later in date, and they're to a, a sort of later iteration of the town, if you like. Now, I think as Steve mentioned, um, well, given the position of, 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 of the site, um, basically before the studios were constructed, there's three phases of archaeological work which were undertaken. Now, the first uh, was an evaluation back in 2009. And then that was followed in 2013 by a larger open area excavation across the footprint of the studios. Um, and then there was a bit of a hiatus. And then in 2018, we actually got commissioned to do the analysis of the work. Um, and that's when we turned our attention to the, the medieval remains. And we really tried to maximize the site's research potential. So I think, as Steve mentioned, what you can see from this is that the whole process has taken rather a long time. Um, but we've got there in the end, and it's not actually that unusual. Some, some projects do take a long time. Um, it's just the nature of the work. Um, I think we've got some projects which we, we did excavations in the 80s, and we're still um, waiting to do the analysis on them. So you can see how this, these things can get very, very stretched out. OK, so before I start looking at the uh, data in a little bit more detail, I think it's worth noting that the excavation indicated that there was no medieval remains directly adjacent to the street frontage, um, as these had basically been destroyed by a cellar of a, of a late 18th century building. So it meant that the, any evidence for medieval activity was confined to the rear portions of the Burgage plot. So when we got all the data in 2018 and we put it all together and we forced it through the, if you like, the, the archaeological sausage making machine and uh, what came out the other end? Well, so what exactly did we find out? Well, the first thing was that we seem to have some very, very limited evidence for early medieval activity, probably dating to the 9th or 10th century. And the evidence for that really was just a few pottery sherds, which they probably reached the site during early cultivation and manuring. And if that was the case, the cultivated land would probably have lain some distance from the early medieval settlement which, as I said, we think probably could have been in the vicinity of St. Altman's Church. Um, there is a possibility, though, that there was actually an early route running along Sadler Gate, probably over, over the brook to St. Werberg's Church, possibly if St. Werberg's Church dates to the 9th or 10th century, certainly pre-conquest in date, uh, but we're not exactly sure of the foundation date for that either. Um, so the second phase of activity we found at the site um, relates to the later medieval, medieval activity, uh, and that was when the Burgage plots on Sadler Gate were established. So the, the, the features and deposits dating to this phase, they represented the most extensive archaeological remains at the site, and they produced a fair-sized assemblage of medieval pottery. Um, for those of you interested in pottery, um, it's fairly typical for this period. The fragments are from jugs, cooking pots, and what we call pipkins, the, like a, basically a ceramic saucepan, and some were glazed. And when we look at the pottery, it's, there's various types, but the most prevalent, as you can see from this, this table here, was the Burley Hillwares, 
um, which is probably not that surprising as the kilns were just north of Derby. So they're using a lot of local material. The thing about the pottery, the important thing is, is the date of it. And it suggests we've probably got a 12th century date for the establishment of the Burgage plots. And then they were used very intensively across the 13th century. So it's conceivable that they were the Burgages were probably established when the town first received its charter about 1200. So all good. Now, if we look at the features that the pottery came from, they included pits, post holes, gullies and floors, garden soils, other horticultural features. And, and the archaeology is quite subtle, really. It's just smudges of colour in the ground, um, which, uh, you know, denoted the position of the features. And these were full with sort of artefacts and charcoal. Um, so it's not, it's not exactly very spectacular to look at, if you like, but it does contain a lot of important information. Now, one of the interesting things that the excavation exposed was the actual physical remains of the, of the Burgage plots. So we had sort of the shadows of timber fence lines, and they seem to have acted as the boundaries of the plots. So you can see we've got uh, the boundaries for both sides of that Burgage plot one there. Um, and we also had a ditch at the back uh, of the Burgage, which seems to have formed the rear boundary of the Burgage plot. And, and next to that, we had actually found a midden, uh, which was full, full of animal bones, suggesting they were taking rotting carcasses and throwing them in the back of the Burgage plot. Um, so that's all very delightful. Um, it does get more delightful as I go along, I promise. Um, now, the other post holes and gullies, they related to the remains of two 13th to 14th century timber buildings. Um, so one of these buildings, um, which is on this slide, which is building two, that was quite, it's quite a large structure. Um, it's got post holes and a construction trench, um, which probably had a sill beam in, defining its walls. And it's got a cobble floor inside. And it also produced quite a bit of medieval tile, suggesting that it had a tile roof. Um, now, the function of that one is it's quite difficult to, to work out um, on the surviving evidence, which is, is fairly piecemeal, to be sure. Uh, but as I said, it seems to be quite substantial. So it could have been a, an outbuilding, or it might even have been used as a secondary dwelling uh, behind the main dwelling, which lay on the street frontage there. Now, the other building, we've only got the corner of that building, but again, it's a, a timber building, uh, probably a shed of some description. And now, interestingly, um, what we found here, there was a lot of ironworking waste and, uh, and, and, and slag. And we actually found the base of a small smelting furnace within it. So we can be pretty sure that it functioned as a workshop involved in both the production and the smithing of iron, which was actually a little bit surprising because we always assume that the iron working would be confined to iron gate and not Saddler Gate, so that did come as a bit of a surprise. Um, now, the most prominent later medieval features were a series of large pits that had been dug across the site, and we had 17 examples, and they're highlighted in green on this slide. So you can see them, they're scattered across the two burgage plots there. Now, all of them have been intentionally filled with waste, uh, which I'm going to say more about in a moment. And once they've been filled, most of them have been capped with layers of cobbles, um, and that was to consolidate them. So 
the photograph there just shows what they look like when we first discovered them. As I say, they're not actually very spectacular, um, but they did turn out to be very important, as I'll, as I'll um, mention in one moment. Um, so many of them are just isolated examples, and some of them were sort of intercutting, as we can see from the, the section drawings there. Um, so that was phase two. Now, there was another phase of activity, of medieval activity on the site, um, and that dates to the very end of the medieval period. Um, the remains associated with this were much more limited, and they comprised three large pits. Now, the, we established the date of these pits um, through radiocarbon dating, and we also they also contained a bit of Midlands purpleware, which may have been produced in Ticknell, and we all know where that is now from the last talk. Um, so if you look at the dates uh, for these, they're quite wide ranging. But if you look at the the, the highest percentages, are that the pits date between about 1450 and, and 1530. So they probably date to the late 15th, early 16th century. And what it seems from this is that if they did date to that period, there was probably a gap in activity or an abandonment phase spanning the mid 14th century. And that could well be down to the, uh, the Black Death which resulted in serious reductions of medieval urban populations. So perhaps at the, uh, you know, in the 14th century, it was depopulated a little bit, Saddlegate, and then uh, they went back there in the, the sort of latter part of the 15th century. Now, it's actually the large pits from the phase two and three, um, phases of activity, which turned out to be the most significant features at the site. And they were exceptionally rich in cultural material, such as pottery, also environmental material that had been preserved through waterlogging. And we spent quite a lot of time sieving, processing and analysing the soil that we removed from these pits. Uh, this table here, the crosses show, there's a selection of pits there, and it shows the sort of what material some of the pits had them in, had, had in them. Um, what, we, what, we, what we seem to have, though, when we looked at the soil from there, it seems that much of it was actually derived from uh, human excrement. Um, and so they were probably cesspits. Or I think to use, uh, excuse me if I use the vernacular, uh, they were shitholes. Um, and very good ones at that. Um, so they basically, these pits lay in the in the, portion, the rear portion of the burgage plots, and they actually contained lots of very valuable information relating to the diet of Derby's medieval peoples. So when we looked at all the plant remains recovered from there, from the from the phase two pits. So basically those dating to the 12th to 14th centuries, these included, the plant remains included charred cereals, which indicated that the people on Sadlergate were consuming oats, rye and bread wheat. Bread wheat. Um, and we also know they're probably eating peas and beans. And we know this because we found bean weevils in one of the pits. And there you can see a bean weevil crawling over to that pit, just about to throw itself in, which is quite fortunate for us. Um, we also found the remains of elderberries and blackberries. So they would have grown locally and they were a sort of wild food stuff. They might have grown in the plots themselves. And um, we also found figs as well. Um, so, the elderberries and blackberries, as I said, would have grown locally, but the figs, they would have been an exotic imported food stuff. And even if fig trees were cultivated in medieval Britain, they're probably unlikely to produce 
fully ripened fruits. So what we do know about figs is they're one of the cheapest medieval food imports and they were probably consumed when the native fruits were not available. So they might have been filling in the gaps when they couldn't get access to elderberries and blackberries. Now, the other thing these pits contained was a common selection of, of medieval culinary and medicinal herbs. Um, now, these included hemlock, henbane, and black nightshade, and they're all poisonous plants. Um, now, the deadliest of these is hemlock, which I think if you ingested as a medicinal plant, it would have required some very careful preparation, such as cooking, to try and dissipate its poisonous properties. Um, now, historically, hemlock was used, we know it's used as a sedative and an antispasmodic. And during the medieval period, it was thought that if you mixed it with betony and fettle, it could cure the bite of a rabid dog. So maybe there were some rabid dogs running around Derby at this time. Um, now, black nightshade and henbane, they could have been used as painkillers pain or sedatives, whilst the bruised fresh leaves of black nightshade could be used to ease pain and inflammation. Henbane as well, it's also it's a very powerful psychoactive material which can induce hallucinations. So I'm not saying that's what they were doing there on Saddle the Gate, but you know, it could have whiled away the hours uh, uh, on those long medieval winter nights. Um, so apart from um, the herbs, now the, the pits also contained quite a bit of animal bone and fish bone. So the animal bone, you can see there on that table, um, it basically indicates that the three main domesticates, cattle, sheep and pig, were consumed. So no, no great surprises there. But what we also found is that fish was another major element of the later medieval diet in Derby. And the great majority of the fish that were recovered were freshwater fish. So they're probably from the River Derwent. And most were quite unusually, they were very, very small in size. Um, and many of the bones are from small fish that would we'd now considered inedible, like including sticklebacks. We know we we know that they ate them because the fish bones were distorted from going through the digestive tracts of humans. So they were definitely eating these things. Um, how they were eating them, we don't know. They were probably well, if we imagine, you know, the medley, medieval equivalent of Keith Floyd. Um, Perhaps, you know, he was wandering into Sadler Gate, having a slurp of ale and throwing a few sticklebacks in a pot and boiling them. Um, so we could have um, Derbyshire's equivalent of Boyer base, um, probably made with river water and a few turnips thrown in. So how appetising that is, I don't know. Um, probably not one for a Saturday morning kitchen anyway. Um, now, we know sea fish as well were also consumed. Um, and they're probably from preserved fish, pickled or smoked or salted. And together, the fish is probably, it's a fairly cheap food stuff. And it indicates that the Sadler Gate Burgesses were not particularly affluent. Although its inhabitants, although the people there, they must have had access to fishing equipment. And it would have included some very fine nets as well to catch these tiny little sticklebacks and other little fish. Um, the pits as well, what we found as well, they were actually full of insects as well, which is a, a brilliant source of information. Um, the highlights of these insects, well, I've mentioned the bean weevil already, but we also had a hide beetle, and that confirmed that leatherworking formed an element of industry on Sadler Gate, which, hooray, was probably no great surprise. Um, now, the other insect remains we had were, were woodworm beetles, and they suggested that they would have come from long-lived, reasonably high-quality timber buildings. Um, 
that were probably found along the Sudler Great Sudler Gate street frontage. So basically, although we didn't have any physical remains of these buildings, if you remember, I said that area had been destroyed by an 18th century cellar. We know from these tiny little beetles that there probably was some very sizable, substantial buildings there once. So just goes to show, you know, the absolute benefit of looking at some of these remains. Um, moving on to quickly to phase three pits. Now they were also highly significant and they suggest that during the 15th and 16th centuries, the people were also using a variety of medicinal and culinary herbs. Um, though what's happening now is that the diet has become much more varied uh, compared with the 12th and 14th century diet. Um, and it seems that this included plants, again, either locally collected or perhaps directly cultivated in the burgage plots. Although I'm not sure how nice that would have been right next to your cesspit, but uh, I think, uh, you know, attitudes were slightly different then. And also, again, we get imported fruits. So significantly, we get grapes appear for the first time. And they're probably coming in as raisins and currants rather than being used for from wine or verjuice, etc. And corn cockle as well was another very interesting find. Um, and that was recorded in one of the phase three pits, uh, which although toxic is potentially a homeopathic remedy used to treat jaundice and swelling caused by water retention, which to give it its old school name was known as dropsy. Um, so I think just summing up now, because I feel like I'm coming to the end of this. Um, now what we can, what's clear from this is that the medieval remains that we found there in, on the Sadler Bridge studios, they form actually a really, really important addition uh, to the very small corpus of excavated sites that we have in, in, in Derby's historic core, which I've put there as dots on this map. Um, so we've basically got King Street and Full Street. They're both published in the uh, Derbyshire Archaeological Journal. There was also a very big excavation at Derby Magistrates Courts, I think in the early part of this I don't know, in the early 2000s, but unfortunately that's never been published. Um, and there's some piecemeal remains at St. James's Yard as well. Um, I think what the, the real beauty of this work is that I think for a site that initially didn't seem that spectacular, um, the actual we've actually achieved our Oxford archaeology's goal here. And I think we have fully, um, you know, maximised the research potential of the site and extracted as much information as possible. And as I say, I think we've got actually a really valuable data set here uh, to understand life and diet of uh, Derby's medieval inhabitants. And there, I would like to end that talk. Uh, so thanks for listening. That was great. Um, a virtual round of applause. It's a shame we can't all... <laughs> sure. Sure, um, I, I think that book. really does um, sort of show yeah. how the, you know, painstaking specialist work can, you know, help us to reach out and touch the lives of people in the past. I think the, the evidence on diet and medicinal herbs and yeah. all that sort of stuff is just amazing you know and it, it's well worth the uh, well worth the wait I, I, really. I think really you, you're right there i think what we have to realize is that you know from we do a lot of, we, we do a lot of sampling of soils and, and things like that and, and, and actually it's it's very very beneficial the the information we can get out of this you know um the fantastic it's got a fantastic assemblage of paleo botanical remains from there and I think I've just seen on the chat someone saying, is it going to be published? Well, it will be. We're going to be publishing it in uh, the next Derbyshire Archaeology Journal. And there's also uh, the report is also on the Oxford Archaeology uh, Digital Library. 
So if you find Oxford Archaeology, the digital library, you can download the report and see how many beetles we found and um, <laughs> other bits and bobs. Uh, so I should add to that, we also um, link through to the, uh, the, the, the grey literature reports okay. from our HER website, okay. so you will be able to click through to the um, the reports for this site on our website as well. Um, Anna, are there any are there any other questions in the chat for Richard? Quite a few. So um, the first one was an observation: as the site lies close to the course of the Mark Eaton Brook, um, yeah. is there any sign of water logging on the site? Well, yeah, the, the, the bottom of the pits that I've been talking about were basically wet, which is why. This is why we had this fantastic assemblage of insects and um, plant remains. If 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 the water levels had been lower, this a lot of this stuff wouldn't survive. Um, you, you're also quite fortunate with set pits; they're quite unique um, depositional environments, if I could put it that way. Um, they actually the character of what goes in there it, it seems to uh, mineralize a lot of things and, and preserves it as well so they were the if you hit cesspits you know you, you're in for fun basically uh, and uh, you can get absolutely loads of info out of it and there'll be i no doubt there'll be many more around that area as well if there's any more development around there there'll be a stack more of that sort of stuff you know so uh be really worth take taking the approach we've we've adopted here and, and, and doing it and do some more of it because you get some fantastic data from yeah, it, yeah that's wonderful so there were quite a few comments about figs and fish so i'll try and sort of figs and fish. pull some of those together yeah. so firstly um someone observed we successfully grow figs every year in derby was the medieval climate significantly different that figs couldn't be grown then oh well I think the climate was probably a little bit warmer in um, in there's a climatic optimum. Now, I can only go on um, what what we sort of know, what the paleo botanists tell us from the literature, and they're, they're quite adamant that it would have been quite hard to grow figs in in medieval uh, Britain. But maybe, maybe what you're saying, maybe maybe they were. Um, I don't know how we would actually prove whether they were native or or, or, or exotic because they're by yeah. nature an exotic plants. So it'd be quite difficult to decide. Um, We'd had a there's a been a few bits of chat around um, varieties of figs and needing to have the fig wasp to um, right. fertilize them and observations that Sheffield grows figs and that in post medieval wow. times the warm water from the steelworks helped to kind of germinate those those um, farms <laughs> along the river valley or along the rivers which is true as far as I know so there's been quite yeah. a lot of fig fig interest there's quite a well, bit of small fish interest also small there's, fish a, interest. there's, there's um, <laughs> an observation that the complete angler contains a recipe for minnow tansy which I quite like Ooh, and delicious. there's there's a question as to whether the so-called inedible fish could yeah. have been eaten by dogs and pigs rather than the humans so might they have been animal food they, they, they could have done but the, the the dogs and pigs would have to have been using the toilets um so whether they true <laughs> <laughs> whether they were very well trained maybe they're very well sure. well behaved <laughs> yeah. I, might, I might say about um, the, cess, the cesspits so we actually found some wooden structures over them as well so we think they were actually they probably had a might have had a seat on them if you like actually you know actually like a toilet and then you would have probably just poured loads of other waste down it as well um so yeah and well, related to that question there's a there's a question as to whether sticklebacks have been found in other archaeological sites um to your knowledge as well or is this I, 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 I would have to ask our fish expert on that um, um all i can say is the fish expert was quite surprised by that she she thought the assemblage was very very unusual for a medieval assemblage because you don't normally find that quantity of very small fish um that was what struck you know that stuck out and and again i think she thought that, that it was quite unusual to find sticklebacks and these other things so it seems quite unique to derby maybe there was a you know particularly culinary uh preference for, for for that type of food or it's just what you could get your hands on um and throw in the pot um 
So yeah. yeah. I'm loving that Floyd-esque stickleback and, turn, <laughs> stickleback and turnip stew. Sounds fantastic. No, I think we'll squidge one more in, which is, is there any evidence for Derby being a Saxon burr? Uh, oh, it's, it's a difficult one. It, it, well, th there is literary evidence. It definitely was a Saxon burr. Um, but we just can't find exactly where it was. Um, but it's probably, it, it probably was up round, round King... King Street, Queen Street, around there. There's, if anyone's interested, there's a very interesting paper in last year's Derbyshire Archaeological Journal, which talks all about where early medieval Derby could be, and that's by Chris Waddle. So I would recommend reading that, and that would answer any questions um, regarding that. But there would, be, there will be one somewhere, but it's whether there's any evidence surviving or whether we actually. Find it. Well, there was definitely churches, you know, St. Altman's is definitely Saxon, probably, and St. Werberg's probably Saxon, but the actual settlement is, is tricky to find that, yeah. Okay, thank you. We'll leave that there. Thanks, Steve, as well. Thank you, Richard. That's been well, okay. It's been my pleasure to speak to you all. And um, you come again. Yeah. Next time we dig in Derby, I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Cheerio. Cheers. Before I do the move on, um, can I just check that we've got our, our next speakers um, are here and uh, and mic'd up? It's uh, Will and Chris. Yeah, I'm here too. Oh, I can hear voices. That's good. Um, I've also been asked to tell you uh, if you're active on Twitter, uh, we've got our Twitter account at Derbyshire Arc online now, and the hashtag is hashtag Derbyshire Archaeology Day. So do spread the word. Um, now, we're, we're all increasingly aware of climate change at the moment and the fact that we're getting more extreme weather, he says, with the sun in his eyes. Uh, and, and in the heritage community, we're, we're increasingly aware of the impacts of extreme weather on, on the archaeological resource. Um, you may have seen the, the collapsed lime kiln at uh, Minninglow, for example. Um, the next site is a bit of a a case study. It was discovered when uh, waterlogged wood scoured out of a bypass channel in the Dove Valley um, during the floods last winter. And, and as you're about to hear, extreme weather has played a bit of a part in the story of its excavation during the course of 2020. Um, so I'm going to, this is a bit of a, a, a double act. I think Will Kelly of CFA Archaeology is going to start us off and then hand over to Chris Kravich of Trenton Peak Archaeology for the second part of the talk. So I'll hand over to, to Will now, hopefully. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, yeah, hello, uh, I'm, so I'm Will. Um, I was the on-site supervisor for the excavation. Um, so my company, CFA Archaeology, acted on behalf of the Environment Agency and Stonbury, who are the specialist contractors, along with staff from Trenton Peak Archaeology. Um, so we were commissioned to excavate the wooden remains at the Dovecliffe Bypass Channel. Christina, who will follow me, is uh, a manager at Trenton Peak Archaeology. Um, so yeah, her, she will sort of follow me for the second half of the presentation. So today I'll be discussing the discovery of timbers at the Dovecliffe site, um, our strategy for excavation and how we recorded the feature. So for a little bit of site background, the weir no longer serves a function and its removal will allow for a a more natural deposition of sediment within the river, which will improve habitats as well as improving the conditions for migrating fish. So on to the archaeology. The initial archaeological assessment was carried out when several wooden timbers were revealed following flooding damage to the temporary bypass channel. These were being excavated as part of enabling works for the removal of the weir to improve biodiversity and fish passage for the entire dove catchment. So as you can see on the image on the left, um, this is what could be seen at this point when we made the initial assessment. A number of wooden timbers which were uh, underwater. The image on the right shows what the timbers looked like when the water levels were reduced at a later date. Um, a number of loose timbers were also found during the initial archaeological assessment. These were seemingly from the same feature as the underwater timbers and likely displaced by severe weather. A number of these were photo drawn and recorded using written context sheets. So although we did an initial watching brief, uh, limited archaeological investigation, 
due to the potentially substantial remains, it was decided to increase the size of the investigations. And we primarily wanted to investigate the age, function and significance of the structure. So on to strategy. The initial strategy for the site was to dig four trenches into the banks of the bypass channel. And this would confirm whether or not timbers extended beyond the initial discovery and how far these potentially extended. No timbers were discovered in trenches one and two, um, but sections were recorded in these uh, trenches. Uh, a number of small tim a small number of timbers were found in trench three on the northern bank, but a considerable number more were found in trench four, which was on the southern bank. Uh, radiocarbon dating done for some of these revealed dates of 1296 to 1409 AD and eight, uh, 1485 to 1650 AD and these results suggested we were looking at uh, possible late medieval precursors of a later weir uh, with possible remains spanning the early post-medieval period. Um, we also have dendrochronology samples still pending and I think Christine will talk a little bit more about um, some of those results later. So this is significantly older than we expected and demonstrated longevity to the structure. And as a result, we decided to conduct a more in-depth investigation into the timbers found in trench four. So the first aspect of this would be to fully reveal the extent of the timbers in the trench. These would then be recorded before moving on to digging a section through the middle of the trench to get a better understanding of how the feature was constructed and its possible function, which again, I think Christine will elaborate on a little bit as well. Um, the final aspect of the trench would be to try and take down the level enough to potentially see the base of the structure. We did attempt this using a machine digger, but unfortunately we weren't able to quite reach the depth due to uh, water levels and also for health and safety considerations. Um, the picture on the left of the slide gives you a bit of an idea of the type of conditions we were dealing with in the trench. Um, so it was often very wet and muddy and required daily water drainage within the trench. Um, and also daily cleaning for record, uh, recording of the archaeology to prevent damage to the timbers um, through exposure to the weather. We would also cover them overnight using tarps. Um, so once we'd finished in trench four, we then wanted to move on to the bypass channel. The plan was to lower the overall water level so we could get a better idea of how many timbers there were and how they were arranged. And this would allow us also to use laser scanning to create an image of the area. Once, and I think uh, Christine will have a little slide to do with the laser scanning as well. Um, so once this is completed, we plan to remove a sample of the channel timbers for further recording. And also a dendrochronologist would also come out to the site to take samples from some of the well-preserved timbers. Once completed, we'd leave the majority of the timbers in situ and backfill the archaeological area to prevent damage to the timbers in the feature. Uh, so on this slide, we have two images and these were created using GPS mapping data and photos taken from trench four. Um, so once the initial area had been cleaned and more of the timbers had been exposed, the GPS mapping data of the timbers revealed in the trench was used to create a line drawing that you can see on the left. This demonstrates the general arrangement of the timbers. Many were horizontally placed, although a number were also vertical or at 45 degree angles. The photogrammetry was done to create uh, accurate imagery for the feature uh, and can be seen on the right hand side of the screen. And this is a technique that we used again later whilst excavating trench four. So we can see section number one at the top left of the screen. This section demonstrates the broad construction of the feature with large timbers arranged horizontally, vertically and at 45 degree angles with packing branches in between. We can also see layers of sediment in a section that would have built up over time. Section one was photoed and drawn before a second section was built through section one to gain a better understanding of the feature. And that's section two. Um, and this went down through nine layers or spits of packing branches. So each layer was removed, cleaned, photoed and drawn. Um, and you can see how we did that on the image on the right. At every level, we also took aerial photos and compiled photogrammetry images as well. So the eventual section shows a densely packed series of branch layers, which we used to collect sediment for the feature. 
Um, and it was during this time in the excavation that we began to consider the likely functions of the feature. Um, I'll go over a couple now. I think, again, Christine will go over it in a little bit more depth later on. So the predominant theory at this point was that the feature had acted as an embankment, which was built to slow the natural water course or possibly to prevent flooding from the uh, adjacent countryside, which is something that still affects the landscape today, as we discovered during our excavations. The brushwood that had been packed between a series of upright timbers could also have been used to hold them together as a support structure whilst in use um, or as a possible platform for temporary works. However, the most likely function of the feature appears to have been as a river embankment within which the brushwood would have allowed silt build up the artificial bank. Um, so extracting the channel timbers, once the water levels were reduced to suitable levels, using a number of water pumps, we were able to use a uh, laser scanner to create an image of the bypass channel, including the timbers. From this, we were able to create a plan of the timbers showing how they've been arranged and at what, what angles they were placed. We use this to help us decide on and identify 10 of the larger and better preserved timbers to be removed and used for further recording. So we used a strap um, placed around each selected timber, which was then pulled out using a machine digger, which is the image on the bottom left. The 10 timbers were placed on the channel bank and each were recorded individually, uh, like you can see on the bottom right of the slide. Um, so first we took photos for each timber including photogrammetry for more accurate representation. All the timbers were cleaned thoroughly of mud prior to photos being taken because, as you can imagine, being underwater for so long, um, they weren't in the best condition. Um, so as well as written context sheets and sketches, a professional archaeological illustrator drew each of the individual timbers, uh, paying close attention to the marks, uh, the worked ends and any other noticeable marks. We didn't know how large the timbers were going to be prior to their removal. Most were several metres long, and the largest of which was around 5.7 metres in length. All of them had pointed ends where they'd been driven into the ground. The size of the timbers was uh, an additional indication that the structure was even more substantial than we'd initially thought. Um, so to conclude my half of the presentation, um, work's continuing currently throughout the weir removal um, and we're particularly interested to see the extent of the possible medieval remains beneath the modern structure. Um, so with that I'll pass on to Christina for the second half of the presentation. Thanks Will. Um, so I think you can appreciate from, from some of Will's images there how difficult the site conditions were. Um, with three-dimensional structures like this, it can be really hard to recreate um, that once you're into the post-excavation assessment stage. So to sort of supplement that data set and to make sure we were capturing the maximum amount of information, we used terrestrial laser scanning. And as you can see from this image, it's captured the entire site. So the entire edge of the temporary bypass channel, the current course of the river, the weir, and those little blue marks there where, where the bypass timbers were located. So it enables us to have a, a point in time record of the excavations themselves in three dimensions. And, and that sort of data we can take and use beyond the scope of, of this project um, and basically forms a principal part of the archive. Um, so from that information, we can create um, plans, section drawings. We can look at the angles of the timbers, um, the orientation. Uh, you can drape uh, the color photography over the top so you can create three dimensional video uh, fly throughs. So again, you're trying, we're trying to provide a record of the site that, that and a visualization that sort of goes beyond a sort of two-dimensional record um, and to my knowledge I think this is the first time um, a structure like this has been laser scanned in the region um, so in terms of, of the sort of data capture we've got a, a high resolution record um, of the site which can be interrogated and used by future researchers so it's a really important way of um, 
representing the site but also preserving that data by record because as Will said a lot of this site has been reburied it's inaccessible um, even at the moment with the weather the way it is we can't even get onto site so you know laser scanning offers an opportunity to, to very quickly capture a lot of high quality data so we have a slight advantage here compared to Oxford in that we're right in the middle of the field work process so we haven't started the post excavation um, analysis. Uh, so the next few slides are just sort of some some thoughts and some things we've been bearing in mind as we've been um, excavating the site. Um, so sort of thinking about construction techniques, the landscape context of the find, um, you know, and then function. Um, so timber structures are incredibly common uh, within the river valleys of, of the East Midlands. Um, and they can really range from anything from the prehistoric to the post-medieval period. Um, a lot of the time, the sort of simple technology of those sorts of sites doesn't really change very much. And it can be very hard to understand how they were constructed. So as you saw from, from the really big timber that, that we'll put up on the screen there, um, all of the large uprights were pointed at one end um, and driven, you know, in some cases, two, three metres into the underlying gravels of the river channel. So that's an extraordinary undertaking. And we, we kind of have to start to think about how is this possible and what techniques um, and equipment might might be used in, in the sort of late medieval period to, to enable these sort of constructions to go ahead. Um, now, we have um, very little information, really, bar a few sort of um, sketches and illustrations from from later documents but certainly for for the upright the most upright piles you know either a post rammer like you see these two gentlemen um, using here was just using brute force to drive it in to the ground um, or techniques that are still used today and um, this photo is from from Thailand which literally relies on the vibration of jumping up and down a plank of wood to pile drive upright timbers into the ground um, and it's a real shame we can't use VO because there is an incredible video of, of this technique and it works incredibly well so you know if, if timbers had to be driven vertically either one of these techniques would seem to be um, possible but we also have to consider that mechanical means may have also been used um, and it was really hard to tell from some of those images but a lot of the timbers in, in the bypass channel were actually driven in um, at a 45 degree angle. Um, now, you wouldn't be able to probably do that with a with a hand rammer or or with the previous sort of techniques. So, are we looking at some sort of mechanical construction um, method? So, these are just some examples of um, those sorts of machines from the 15th and 16th centuries, mainly from from France, uh, the Netherlands, and, and Italy. Um, but you can see, you know, they use counterweights and men on ropes to, to sort of ram home these extremely long piles, some at an angle, some vertically. Um, now, the written accounts that go with these images do say that, that these machines were expensive, they were unreliable and they broke down a lot. So it would have to be worth the investment because it's a specialist piece of equipment you would have to have somebody qualified to actually use it and build it effectively whether this was the sorts of things that would have been used at the site um, we do have references from um, Britain in, in that we have examples from the London Bridge construction which shows a, a hand ram in operation in the middle of the river um, and we have references to pile driving at Rochester. So we know it was happening. We just don't have contemporary uh, images and, and drawings to show exactly how these posts were, were in place. Um, so again, we're, we're having to think and uh, sort of come up with ideas of where to look for this sort of information um, because it's quite an un understudied area of, of uh, medieval construction, really. Um, and later examples, obviously into the 18th century, you have the similar sorts of um, machines, except they're powered um, by horses or by steam. So, again, this is why I mean the technology doesn't really change. It's just we don't know the precise mechanisms that they were using to construct uh, 
these structures. Um, the other thing we're having to think about is, is landscape context of the site. Um, so the Dove Valley is a, an incredibly dynamic system. Um, you can see from this LIDAR image um, just how many paleo channels are visible just in the LIDAR, let alone deeper channels that, that don't get picked up by LIDAR. Um, with our site, it looks to be sitting in a minor paleo channel that's parallel to the current course of the river. Um, and again, that's something in conjunction with the timbers that we recovered. We've also recovered sediment samples um, to try and understand the behaviour of the river and how the sediments relate to that structure. Um, we also have other uh, examples um, within the Dove Valley itself. Um, so this is an example of a wooden structure published um, by the late Chris Salisbury in the late 90s, um, in which it was interpreted as a kid weir. So you had upright posts with these bundles or kids, which is just bundles of brushwood, round in between upright posts and then secured with um, a hole drilled through the top of the upright and then either some rope or um, wattle to, to hold those brushwood bundles down. Um, and in Chris's personal archive we've got some really helpful little sort of sketches of, of how such a, a structure might have might have helped to stabilise um, a bank after a scour event in the river. Um, now this example is later in dates or 17th century, but you know the principles might not be that different. Um, so if we consider the context of our site perhaps within that minor paleo channel, and given the uh, levels of high energy within the Dove system, are we looking at a structure that is to do with um, some sort of engineering works to facilitate the construction of, of that central weir structure are we looking at bank revetment where we've had an area of the bank side that's been eroded away and this structure is there to to basically stabilize the ground um, so we're very much in the middle of sort of trying to unpick um those sorts of interpretations there was no other remains um associated with what we excavated so there weren't anything like fish baskets um there doesn't seem to be uh, any evidence for anchor stones at the bottom or packing or anything like that. Um, so in terms of its construction technique, it's quite simple. Um, and what is going to be interesting is to see how it articulates um, with the weir that we're currently working on at the moment and whether that later structure is superimposed over the top of a, of a much earlier uh, medieval structure. So again, it's still very much sort of a work in progress in terms of, of how we're we're interpreting the site. Um, I mean, if it is, like I say, if it's to do with engineering works, we know, you know, right the way through from the medieval period to, to um, the post medieval period, you've got large undertakings of what we would consider, you know, engineering. Um, and you can see from this account from repairing the weir at Nottingham from 1318, you have to have carpenters on site sharpening the piles. Um, you would have had to have work crews available to drive the piles in. So we do have documentary accounts for such structures. It's just defining what our structure represents. Um, and like I say, if it is to do with a sort of enabling works phase um, to help construct a weir by diverting water or supporting the banks, you know, we can see examples of that in, in later um, sources like this uh, painting from the Wellington Dock at Dover, you can see here, you've got an incredible hole in the ground held up with pretty chunky shoring and the level of the ships in the background, that's, you know, the, the water level is there. So, you know, we, we're dealing with an extremely dynamic environment currently and, and that situation would have been exactly the same um, in the past. So it's possible and, and things that we think look impossible because of the conditions we're in currently, there will have been ways to, to cope with that and to deal with that. And, and what's been going to be really interesting is to see if this bypass channel structure is, is one of those mechanisms by which, you know, the weir was constructed in the middle of an active river. So what I hope is that with the coming post X programme for this year, we'll be able to 
collate some really good dendro data, um, some wood technology data and landscape data to start to sort of unpick um, the function, the longevity um, and the significance of the site and hopefully present it back to you in the future. Um, so I will stop there, but I'd like to um, thank the Environment Agency and Stonbury for helping us facilitate the work and thanks for letting me come here and talk about it. That's been great. I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to extend you an invitation to come back and, and talk about it in hopefully <laughs> less than 10 years time. No pressure. I think, you, you know, it, it is one of those sites where the real um, meat of it will uh, will come out of the post -ex. Um It's worth saying, it, it, it's something of a a first for the the Dove Valley. I know we've got the, the Dove Bridge one that was done in the 90s, but I mean this is the first one that's been recorded in in such detail, I believe. Yeah, I think, it's, and for me as well, you know, I've been excavated in the Trent Valley quite extensively with wooden structures. We, we yeah, we've never laser scanned one yet, so mm -hmm. this is yeah. So it's, it's it's new territory for Derbyshire, and it's it's great to see that we we're, we're hopefully going to you know be understanding more about the Dub and its um, it, you know its landscape in general. I think it's a little bit of an, an un, under understood region, if I can coin that one. <laughs> Anna, have we got any questions on the on the chat? We do. We've all people are now starting to really get in with the chat we had lots of applause little icons there so thank you some of them you've I'm some of that. you them you answered already so the tim how the timbers were driven in vertically i think you covered there was something around um the photogrammetry how did you gather the data um what platform did you use like did you use a kite or a drone how did you actually gather the photogrammetry information yeah so for the photogrammetry um it's uh, we used a um, I'm trying to remember what it's called now. It, it's a sort of extendable stick that you can attach the camera onto the end of. New software on your phone, so you can press a button on your phone, see in the image, and then it will take it aerially. So for the trend shot that we did, like for the um, the photogrammetry for the big shot there, we wanted to use that to get angles from all around the trench. But then for the later one, so the second section that we did, where you're looking down at the branch bundles, for that, because it's a far smaller area, um, we would simply walk around and take photos using the camera directly. Um, and then that was all processed by um, the graphics department who sort of stitched it all together. I'm afraid I'm not sure exactly what sort of software and things like that they used. OK, thank you. That's helpful. Um, there's a question as to whether it could have been a fish weir I know you had then this came in before you um, then did your explanation of possible functions so maybe that was superseded but presumably it's too big for that or different form yeah I mean I mean I know I know Chris Salisbury in particular you know he, he's published a lot um, particularly in the Trent Valley on where you do have these big dam structures and then you can have sort of fish baskets and fish traps and weirs secured to them so it's almost like a secondary use of a, of a much bigger structure um the levels of preservation weren't great in the majority of the structure but there didn't seem to be anything tied into this so we didn't recover anything like fish baskets and, and again until we do the analysis of the orientation of some of these timbers as well we are still unpicking the site plan to actually even understand you know how these things are laid out and i think the dendro as well is going to be key because that's going to tell us how many phases of, of activity we're looking at here because it looks like a game of kaplunk at the moment but that could be because there's a lot of repair phases so we're still really early in in trying to give a name to it and i really tried hard as well with people on site to not name it yet because things get ingrained in the literature on site and then that becomes the interpretation yeah. and we want to keep quite an open mind in that way okay and i'm laughing because someone's posted would it catch sticklebacks so, <laughs> so that's good but i think uh, we've got time quick not much eating on a stickleback one more i'll pull two together which is a question about 
were any particular types of timber and brushwood used and was there any evidence for certain types surviving better than others? So we were able to take dendro samples so for that they have to be oak um, so a good number of the uprights um, were oak um, some and even some of the brushwood looks like oak as well um, the next stage of our sort of post excavation analysis is to take all of the species ID samples and basically categorize how many different species we're looking at so whether we're looking at people opportunistically just collecting what was available on the floodplain so you know things like hazel and willow and alder or are they bringing stuff from further afield so more dryland tolerant species like oak like ash so until we do um some of that analysis on on the samples the breakdown of which species they're using won't become apparent but we do know the uprights almost certainly all of them have been oak Thank you. Um, I'm keeping an eye on time. Should we have one more? There's a question around, do we know who had ownership rights to the river and who would have ordered or funded the um, construction? Well, that's, that's kind of the interesting thing, really, because obviously we have um, records of a lot of mills um, along the stretch of the dog. So whether it's to do with, um, like I say, an engineering work associated with directly with a single mill or whether it's a group of landowners coming together to, to do this because again it's you know it's an extraordinary investment of, of timber labor you know engineering manpower just to get something like this constructed so whether it's one landowner funding it or whether it's a group of landowners basically trying to get the benefits it's not clear yet but again that hopefully will come out of the, the post excavation analysis and, and historical research Lovely. I think we'll leave it there for questions. I'm just looking at time. Thank you. Steve, back over to you. Thanks very much. Um, we're going to take a, well, thanks very much to our speakers so far. You've all been great. Um, we're going to go to a bit of a break now. Um, so put the kettle on, feed the cat, throw raw meat to the children, do what you have to do. <laughs> and uh, I think we'll aim to meet back here in about 10 minutes time. So say about five to three. Um, Anna, do we have any polls we can put up for people to have a look at during the break? Actually, yeah, we do. I wasn't, I'd, I'd wondered whether to do them tomorrow because a lot of the audience think it's going back tomorrow, but we will do. So let's put out um, a pop this one up. Oh, coming, bear with me. Here's a little poll. Have you attended Dobbshire Archaeology Day in previous years? Awesome. Have a look at that. Great. And we'll see you back see you here shortly. in 10 minutes. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Um, for those that missed it at the uh, beginning, my name's Natalie Ward. I'm the Senior Conservation Archaeologist with the Peak District National Park Authority and I'm just going to be taking us through the last through, through the last few presentations this afternoon. So um, I hope our next speaker is all lined up. Guy Selkeld is joining us from the uh, Defence Infrastructure Organisation, which uh, to you and me is like the Defence Estates. And he's here to present about the investigation and restoration of two scheduled barrows at Meryton Low. Um, following a devastating fire back in the summer of 2018. We had several uh, very bad moorland fires across the Peak District that summer, which I'm sure people can recall. So Guy, do you want to unmute yourself? Make your video available if you wish. Hello. I will hand over to you, Guy, now. Thank you, Natalie. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so yes, uh, as Nancy mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the uh, the repair of these two Bronze Age barrows um, on the Leak Training Estate after a moorland fire. And unlike some of the previous uh, talks that we've just heard, uh, I'm not going to be going into the um, technical details of, of the archaeological investigations and results um, that we gained from this process, but more about the decision making and the um, curatorial side of things and just really the difficulty and complexity of sorting out what was an unexpected and unplanned um, 
event, uh, devastating and extensive, and uh, within a very complex um, designated landscape, basically. So I shall move on to the next slide. Uh, this is our bog standard preamble to any talks about archaeology in the defence estate, uh, just to give some sort of context as well to the um, to the, the process. I, I won't go through all of these figures, but the, we cover approximately one percent of, of the land mass of the UK. Um, you can see there, quarter of a million hectares of land held directly, and then almost the same amount held uh, or, or rather used as uh, tenants. And in this case, the Peak District National Park is our landlord, as we don't actually own the land. Um, the last four lines really are the most significant. 83,000 hectares of triple SI, so sites of special scientific interest. Um, 80,000 hectares of special protected area and, um, oh, I can't remember what the SAC stands for. Um, basically, um, nature conservation designations. 1,200 plus listed buildings and 767 scheduled monuments. And um, that's all used primarily for um, military training. And we have a very small team of environmental uh, subject matter experts in areas such as public access, um, forestry, ecology, historic buildings and archeology span to make sure that we can uh, the MOD can train and fulfil its responsibilities to the um, the environment, basically keeping green and pleasant lands uh, green and pleasant uh, whilst also training. And uh, let me move on. Here is a uh, leak training area. It sits within this triangle of uh, major cities of Manchester and Sheffield, and then uh, Stoke-on-Trent, and it's fairly sizable, it's round the size of Macclesfield and um, used extensively and uh, regularly. It's a dry training area so there's no live firing of uh, ordnance or um, uh, machine gun bullets or anything like that. Uh, it's used for basic military skills and as the military describe it, um, arduous training on open moor which always fills me with a bit of a shiver. Um, basic battle skills, and it's used by RAF, uh, Army, um, Navy, and uh, regulars, reserves, and cadet units as well. And it can take up to 800 troops with ease, basically. Um, one thing that I should mention at the start, all of our training areas have um, what we call integrated rural management plans. So this takes together all aspects of um, the use of the, of the, of the estate, that the military use is described for, for leak and the archaeology and the nature conservation interest and what have you. And we undertake uh, regular five yearly condition surveys as well of our of our scheduled monuments. Uh, it's four years for listed buildings and, and five years for the, for the monuments. And then um, the condition is assessed and fed into uh, management plans, basically, which inform our funding applications for the following year. We have a ring fenced uh, conservation stewardship fund budget, which is specifically for uh, these sorts of things. And the team itself, the archaeology team, our, our prime role is to um, support the Ministry of Defence through um, major programmes of development and infrastructure works and to um, help them understand the sorts of things that they need to do um, through, the, through the planning process and then uh, managing um, the historic estate and particularly uh, managing heritage at risk as well and, and making sure that our monuments are in as good a condition as they can be. And here, uh, Leek actually only has two scheduled monuments on it, uh, and both of those were affected by the fire that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. So uh, both Bronze Age um, barrows, the, uh, the numbers for anyone interested, um, you can look them up on the National Heritage List. Uh, this is Merritt and Lowlong uh, Bowl Barrow in the uh, photograph 1008973. And then to the south of this is a much smaller um, and less obvious barrow, which is 1008974. 
The jig point's not part of the scheduling, but there is a plaque there, which is a memorial to um, the Home Guard. Uh, so that's uh, a listed uh, listed structure, although thankfully that wasn't affected by the fire. And the whole area, uh, not only is it um, within a triple SI, it's a very ex extensive triple SI, but as it sits and is owned by the uh, Peak District National Park, there's also um, a more enhanced landscape aesthetic and uh, an additional uh, curatorial aspect to, to this as well. And just to give you uh, an idea of the um, extent of the fire, it was um, 18 hectares. And you can see here on this um, aerial photograph, which I, I got from um, Bing, I think it was, uh, search engine. And the, the burned area really stands out well. You've, you've got this almost triangular parcel of land, of moorland. And I don't think we know fully how the fire started. Um, thankfully, it wasn't um, live firing or anything like that. So it's very unlikely that it was through military activity. The, uh, this, this took place in July 2018. And um, as Natalie mentioned, there'd been a number of fires, uh, which you probably all know a lot more about than I do. Um, I, I'm not in the area. I'm, down, I'm based down in Wiltshire. So this is quite remote for me. Um, but you can see that the, the tracks there, particularly on the on the two northern sides of the triangle, um, acted as very effective fire breaks. And this is what we try and build into our live firing areas, uh, fire breaks to, to try and contain uh, fires such as this. And here's a photograph of what it looked like on the ground. Not quite. Dovecliff Weir levels of um, wetness, but I wouldn't have been surprised to find a stickle back on that day. Uh, this is a, a first trip that we had up there to look at it that, um, with uh, Anna um, from the National Park and um, Natural England were there, and my colleague uh, Marina, my, uh, who's an ecologist also. Uh, it was a really horrific day anyway, the weather wise, but you can just see that denuded and burnt landscape there over a, a, a big area. Um, it looks much more extensive on the ground than it does on, on the aerial photograph because you don't have that sense of scale really. And you can see uh, just in front of my um, right foot there uh, some little um, bits of uh, vegetation that are, that are sticking up. Uh, that basically gives you the amount of peat that was burned away. It was um, 15 centimetres or so, basically, um, which perhaps doesn't sound a lot for, for uh, peat upland, but when that's the only cover there is, um, that's really significant. So some bits of vegetation start to come back, but they were very hardy species and, and not the sorts of things that uh, really contribute to the, the significance from um, a triple SI point of view. And then there's another shot here where you can see um, the underlying ground surface surface starting to come through as well. I think this is actually over the, the southern of the barrows and you can see how difficult it is really to, to see it. And this left us with a tremendous problem about what to do with it. Um, not only the barrows themselves, but the wider area too. It, it, it was just so huge and um, so unexpected and I mentioned earlier that we have funding for these sorts of things um, but this was unplanned and the nature of, of the damage was unknown as well so really really difficult to respond from a corporate point of view uh, we have a very detailed contract with a company called Landmark who um, actually carry out the works that, that we specify need to be done and things like this these sorts of events they, they, they fall into a, a little bit of a contractual um, grey area so uh, there's, a, there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done behind the scenes to try and decide um, what we need to do about these things. What, one thing that was crystal clear was that we needed to do something. Um, our protocols for the care of the historic estate uh, drive that 
And one of my objectives each year is to remove heritage at risk um, from the defence estate. And these two barrows, and, and they're two separate monuments as well, were instantly placed on the heritage at risk register by Historic England. So um, that provided the justification for us to start taking action and uh, assessing what we needed to do. And basically, we decided we needed to understand the impact um, of the fire and, and, and what it revealed, uh, stabilise the monuments in some way, um, and then understand the impact of the fire uh, on, on the monuments themselves in, in, in terms of the archaeology, um, and then decide what was going to take place to, to repair these things fully and, and try and bring them back to the, the same sort of um, situation as they were before the fire. And at every stage, there were things that we had to think about um, to, to make those decisions, uh, mostly to do with the fact that they were both scheduled and under uh, SSSI. So there are two sets of statutory uh, requirements there. And although they're all designed to protect various aspects of either the natural or historic environment, they don't always work together. So this was one of those points where we needed to um, consider all sides of the arguments and, and take a really interdisciplinary uh, approach. And the first thing that happened was that uh, the Southwest Peak Landscape Partnership, Partnership Scheme very kindly carried out um, an initial survey of uh, what the fire had revealed. So this is just the front sheet from their report. Um, Dr. Catherine Parker Heath valiantly, and I, and I, I don't use that word lightly, uh, took a group of, um, let me see, uh, 15 volunteers uh, into the field uh, over seven days between November and December in 2018. And um, you can see every photograph of this seems to have uh, rain spots on the lens. You can see there that they worked under uh, very difficult uh, circumstances. They took um, photographs and they, they plotted the uh, extent of the damage there. And they produced some uh, really lovely uh, hatched drawings of the barrows themselves. I've, I've only put some example figures here from the, the report that they sent to us just to illustrate the sorts of work that they did. Um, they revealed over a well they revealed 108 features across that triangle of um, land and recovered 101 finds everything from little bits of military debris uh, it, when we fire but we fire blanks and they still produce cartridges and things and, and, and pieces of metal of unknown origin uh, sometimes going back quite a way uh, they found bits of uh, struck flint um, and so they made a really good inventory, basically, of what of what the fire had revealed. Um, we didn't know a huge amount about this area prior to this the fire. The uh, there was some information in the national park, the Peak Parks uh, HER, and it had been subject to a very brief survey in 1988. But so we had enough to show that there would be archaeology there, but we didn't have a full um, full picture. So uh, Catherine and her volunteers uh, basically produced this work, which was uh, re really uh, useful and, and needed. And then in a parallel process, we needed to dis decide how to uh, stabilise the monuments. And I know this is a rather um, sort of uh, plain photograph of, of some people um, w at work, but to me, it represents um, a, a huge amount of background work and decision making. We, uh, it was pretty clear from the start that we would need to put some kind of material down um, to prevent further erosion um, from both the, the wind and uh, and the rain. The uh, the peat was basically all that had been protecting these monuments and uh, with it, with its absence they were they were incredibly vulnerable I and mean, it really was like looking at a, a, a raw wound 
So we needed to put some kind of sticking plaster on there uh, to stabilize them through the winter so that we could um, make some decisions about what, what would happen next. And it was quite a process because um, Natural England didn't want any sorts of um, alien material bringing in anything that, that wasn't uh, sympathetic to the, uh, uh, the, the soil makeup or the um, vegetation there. So you can imagine that that was quite a strict uh, set of criteria that they laid down. Um, but we also needed something that would be archaeologically benign as well and that would uh, satisfy Historic England's requirements. And after quite a bit of research and um, lots of discussion with Natalie, uh, we discovered this geojute, which I, I seem to think is a, um, a coconut fibre based uh, mat which uh, was laid out um, by hand, it came in rolls. Uh, these, these chaps were all from Landmark, our, our industry partner, and um, everybody basically realised that whatever the cont uh, contractual situations, this just had to be done. So uh, we had one particular day when uh, a whole bunch of people turned up and I went along and helped them carry the stuff and we pinned it down with a uh, starch, uh, I think it's potato based starch pins um, to keep keep the material uh, from flying away uh, in, in the wind. Um, one one observation is that uh, those um, those starch pins were incredibly sharp and uh, only put one in my front pocket once before I realized that was uh, not the best place to, to carry them over um, unstable ground like that. Um, but we managed to get that uh, all of that laid down, and it was really good. the the um, The landmark team, we, we're this particular site is in a, a, an area called Wales and West. So some of these guys had travelled quite away for, and and away from their home bases and stations, and. There was lots of hilarity at the start with, with the, the novelty of the job. Uh, those. Um, some of that, those tussocks there had to be trimmed. You can see one in the sort of middle middle ground there uh, to fit through bits of the geojuke. So there were all sorts of jokes about cutting people's hair and that sort of thing. But it reached a certain point where everybody just gelled together. And then we started getting questions about well, what was the archaeology and what were barrows and that sort of thing. And we ended up having a really great little um, impromptu talk about what the archaeology was. and. Uh, we were left with something looking like this, these big patches, uh, which we knew would um, weather down and, and recede into the background. Uh, but amongst this sort of um, barren, blackened landscape with the, with the rest of the, uh, the moorlands in the background there. And one thing I would like to say about the curatorial side, all, all of my colleagues who from across various organisations who've been involved with this, is that, um, Everybody has a, a real sense of ownership of these monuments and these landscapes. And it, it's genuinely upsetting and uh, hard to deal with. And you see things like this. And, that, and there's a, a real sense of wanting to fix it and wanting to put it right, basically. I, I, I certainly felt that. And I remember driving back, um, back down to Wiltshire uh, the day that we'd laid this and just having such a sense of... Um, feeling that we'd done something good and well and, and that these monuments were protected, ready for the next stage. And, and I'm sure my other curatorial colleagues uh, share those, uh, those feelings. So that was uh, understanding the, the landscape impact of the fire and stabilising them. And the next stage was to try and understand the actual impact on the monuments themselves. So. Uh, moving into our next, the next financial year, th th we were able to start planning once we'd stabilised them. So the um, the uh, the worry of time and all that sort of thing, and and trying to find uh, funding was uh, was relieved for the second year, where we were able to bid for um, very very limited and targeted test pitting. And landmark commissioned Wessex Archaeology North to go in and carry out um, 
a scheme of uh, basically trial pits to work out um, what what had happened and, and what the impact was on, on the subsurface. So they excavated, or oh, I'm just trying to see, um, six hand excavated uh, test pits. And they confirmed that both mounds likely represented barrows, which was a good thing from an archaeological point of view. Uh, and they discovered that the um, barrow that we're looking at in the photo here um, possibly contains a kissed burial at its centre as well. So there's some little lenses there just in the right hand section that you might be able to see. And a more detailed photograph here. So that was good to get some archaeological information out of it. Uh, they found the remains of a dry stone wall corresponding with uh, the boundary between um, the civil parishes of Fourfield Head and uh, Wancote, and also a, a modern pit was identified. Um, and in the other barrow, uh, they found a stone surface sealed beneath beneath the uh, barrow itself, so indicating that there was some sort of activity um, in the past prior to raising the barrow. So, so that was very interesting. The key findings, though, uh, and the things that, that are of importance to this talk, was that despite the um, destruction of the of the peat layer above, um, the barrows themselves had survived quite well. So the archaeology uh, hasn't really been affected, which is uh, really good news. And that brings us up to, well, this is February last year, just before lockdown came in. Um, you can see here that the geojute has begun to um, uh, dissolve, if you like, or, or, or um, break down, and that the vegetation where we laid it down is 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 recovering as well and uh it's really good there's still a few little pins in there perhaps that you can see um but they will break down with time as well and there's a another photo here showing another another part of it this is the, this is the southern barrow which was uh much more um difficult to see in, in the landscape and uh we now have to decide what to do next and, and how to um, make sure that, th that these monuments can um, survive into the future. Because even though the peat was fuel, and that's actually what helped the fire to spread, and that's gone now. So you might argue that the fire risk is now lower for a few years because there's basically nothing left to burn. Um, we are still left with the problem that, that the archaeology is very much more vulnerable than it was before. It's, it's lost that protective um, coating. So we need to think about um, what to do. And also, uh, there's a, a desire to, to reseed and, and bring um, the rest of the moorland that was affected by the fire uh, back into better condition as well. So we're working very closely with uh, the park, Natural England and Historic England and the Environment Agency uh, to take the next steps and the Environment Agency have um, come up with some funding to help uh, reseed and, re and restore the, uh, the wider landscape and we've been able to as an MOD to match fund that um, or, or make a, a sizable contribution uh, to enable the, um, the, pe the park to uh, take these things forward and this is where we're seeing an interesting change in the uh, curatorial side of things. Um, I think both Historic England and Natural England have, have seen that this is so difficult to resolve. And so they've been a little bit more relaxed about uh, the treatments, the specific treatments for the two barrows there. And it's likely that we're going to um, put down another membrane, which will provide an archeological horizon um, some sort of material over the top. We, we, we talked about putting peat over there, and but then you have to source the peat, and then that means there's another impact on a different area, and there's a potential archaeological um, impact there too. You may be disturbing um, mesolithic um, flint spreads, that sort of thing. So, so it all starts to get very complicated, um, and we realised that there was not such a good source of peat anyway. So the likelihood is some sort of material like sand will be going down. 
uh, then with another membrane on the top which will act as a, a bed to help um, keep the uh, the seeds and uh, help them to, to catch and restore and, and rebuild the topsoil. So I don't know if that's more or less complicated than people might have thought it was but it's it's been um, a really, really interesting and challenging uh, journey. Uh, some of the things that I forgot to mention earlier on in the slides, uh, this is very remote as far as I'm concerned. Um, it takes quite a while to get up here. Uh, so I rely very heavily on uh, my friends and colleagues um, up in the National Park and, and, and the, uh, the volunteers to really help out with this. And it's very much appreciated. But also another contradiction or tension is that whilst it's a really remote area, um, it is a national park and it does attract uh, lots of uh, visitors. So there was always that worry that people would not understand what we were doing or that the uh, the area was very fragile. But we, we've had, but well, not to my knowledge, any uh, disturbance or damage from um, recreation or, or visitors or what have you. So the whole thing has been um, quite a success story, we think, although it's taken quite a while to resolve. Um, one of the problems is that uh, with climate change, we're going to see more of this sort of thing, unfortunately. Uh, it's very difficult to know how to predict it or, or mitigate it. We just have to deal with them as they turn up and, and learn from previous experience. So uh, that's quite short, hopefully quite sweet. And um, that's the end of my talk. Behind the scenes, um, a lot of uh, complex discussions and decision makings in that curatorial role, which is what guys um, Guy's talk was, was focused on in that role of sort of managing and, and looking after the historic environment for everybody. And I think the sort of partnership working and the interdisciplinary nature um, and the, the, the complex, sometimes conflicting decisions you're, you're, you're working with in order to try and do the best thing for the historic environment, so that came out really well. So thank you very much. Um, Anna, have we had any questions in for Guy, please? And also a couple of nice observations, someone who used to do um, live firing on the ranges there and someone else who confirmed that the weather was truly atrocious when the first time that, that myself and Guy went up with colleagues to visit. Um, there's a question about were many artefacts found after the fire? Um, I know you weren't there exactly after the fire, Guy. Do you, are you able to answer that? Do you want me to? Uh, well, as I say, um, 101 fines, um, but I don't have the details of the uh, report. We can certainly make that available to people. Um, it should be publicly available, but uh, j just a general spread, really. Yeah, and I think that certainly, I think the volunteers who did the recording of the barrows also logged a lot of those, and I seem to recall that there were things like um, cartridge casings from a wide range, even from sort of the real turn of the century, the sort of typology of different um, ammunition. Uh, there were also other military training things like foxholes and little cut features, um, ammunition clips, binoculars, I think, Natalie, I seem to yeah, recall there's there a, quite a lot of military, so military artefacts, <laughs> knives and forks and bits and pieces. So mostly 20th century um, artefacts that were on the surface of the peat that had been obscured by the vegetation. Uh, what else? I mean, that is one of the things about it that you do, uh, you do get to see that underneath the peat if you like um, so there's always some value to be gained from those sorts of exercises yeah we've had um, a comment and it's valid very valuable one um, that prompt action from the national park rangers and staffordshire fire and rescue service prevented further extensive damage to the archaeology and to the moorland oh. as a whole and um, we're we're grateful for that mm. attention no, absolutely yeah i should have mentioned that um yeah i mean it was the quick response really that that enabled us to go on and, and, and thankfully it wasn't worse. Um, it, there's a question that's about the lithic finds. Do you know anything more about the type of lithic finds? We've got the report, but um, I haven't looked at it in detail yet. We've got the final report. Natalie, I'm 
mentioned I would send that to you. So, uh, yeah, that's that's to be revealed in due course. But it's I do course. recall, yeah. Guy, that um, interestingly, there were some mesolithic finds from the test pits in the Barrows that had obviously been been scooped up in the material as the Barrows were created in the Bronze Age, which is the first indication from that piece of moorland of that, that much earlier activity in the area. So even though we weren't thinking about the Mesolithic, we were thinking about damage to Bronze Age Barrows, it has brought up, as archaeology always does, more things to think about and more questions. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry, I'm just slightly distracted because I've got the report in front of me. I'm just trying to, um, I can't really skim through it. So uh, no, we'll, we'll get we'll get a more detailed discussion out in due course, I think. But yeah, Natalie, uh, thanks for reminding me about yeah, that. I'll, and I'll just do one more because we're running a little bit over. Um, this might be more for Natalie. Has there been any similar considerations needed for the fire on the roaches, which was um, not far away, was it? Only about a mile away? No, no, just, just, just across the way there. Um, Archaeology was absolutely a consideration in the restoration process that went on following the fire at the Roaches and we inputted the, the archaeological advice that was needed for that. Um, the scheduled barrow up on the Roaches wasn't affected by the fire and um, actually there weren't, in the area that burnt on the Roaches, thankfully, there weren't that many archaeological features so it was more of a case of dealing with them carefully and sensitively through the work. We didn't have to um, fund a whole area of archaeological investigation to understand damage or, or anything like that but archaeology has been part of that decision making process for the the restoration of the roaches post the fire as it is for any of our modern fires when they burn it was a, a busy year in 2018 and afterwards responding to the fires that we had in the peak district from an archaeological perspective Thank you very much guy and thank you to everyone for your questions that was uh, really really great and i think um, when the project comes to a close, you might get you to do an update or a peek for our ACID magazine, a piece for our ACID magazine, maybe to update people on the, how those barrows are finally restored and finally look. Thank you very much. So we're coming on to our final presentation for the first half of Derbyshire Archaeology Day today, um, which is from uh, Reuben Thorpe and oh, oh, the video started. There we go. Um, start again, coming from Reuben Thorpe and Tom Park Research Services about their investigations at Hope Shale Quarry, which is coming onto part of the Vicus of Navio Roman Fort in the Hope Valley. Now to say this is um, hot off the press is a bit of an underestimation because the fieldwork team only came off site just before Christmas. So we're really, really early days for the sort of post excavation analysis and assessment. So this is really finding straight out of the field. And as we knew we were going to be doing um, digital for obvious reasons, um, we asked uh, Tom and Ruben to have a go at doing something a bit different for us. So um, speaking to some slides, they've actually made us a video, including footage from site. So um, I'm going to play the video and then afterwards, Ruben and Tom will be joining us to answer questions. Hello, good afternoon and welcome. My name's Ruben Thorpe and I'm Chief Archaeologist at Archaeological Research Services based in Bakewell. And I'm Tom Parker, I'm a Project Officer for Archaeological Research Services out of their Sheffield office. And what we want to do today is talk you through or talk about our recent excavations in the environs of the Roman fort at Navio in the Hope Valley. During this work I've been acting as the project director while I've been running the field team on the ground. And the work itself has actually come about as part of the uh, planning process as Hope Shell Quarry, which lies to the west of the Roman fort, was extending to the east. And in the next half an hour, we just want to talk you through some of our findings. The Roman fort and Vicus at Navio as it's identified in the Ravenna cosmography, lies in the base of the Hope Valley, just to the east of Bradwell, to the south of Hope, um, in the North Derbyshire Peak District. Uh, 
traditionally, the narrative or the overarching story about it is, is that the fort was originally established in timber or in wood about AD 79 and that was then replaced in stone in the uh, second century uh, and it continued in occupation and in use until the mid 4th century AD. Various campaigns of archaeological work have been undertaken on the site and this first began in 1903 where uh, some limited trenching uh, explored the exterior of the fort wall basically to just see what it was um, and this then led ultimately to the uh, designation of the site as being a scheduled ancient monument in November 1925. It wasn't too long after that however that further archaeological works were undertaken most notably in 1938 to 1939 and 1958 to 1959 and 1965 to 1969, this latter piece of work being done by Manchester University. And in fact, part of those excavations is still open. Uh, anybody that knows the site, when they walk across the top of it, will see some large grit stone slabs. And they're actually the remnants of the strong room in the, uh, in the, uh, the boss's palace. So, having explored the interior of the fort, there was then work done mainly to the south and to the east of the fort in the later 20th century. So in 1971 to 72 and 1983 to 84, trenching, uh, open area excavation, largely looked, like I said, to the east and the south of the fort. Now the work in 1971 to 72 uncovered part of what's believed to be a large cobbled area, if you like a large, uh, a large yard surface, a large uh, yard area. And then 1983 to 1984, the road network, largely coming into the, into the east of the fort, um, was, uh, was, uh, was, was explored. Further excavations in 1985 to 86, undertaken by the Department of Archaeology at the University of Sheffield. Indeed, while I was myself an undergraduate at Sheffield, largely focused on exploring an area to the, to the west of the fort. Um, surprisingly, actually, uh, in advance of the planting of a tree screen between the, uh, the Pope Shell Quarry, which exists to the, uh, to the west, and the fort itself, the scheduled ancient monument to the east. So jumping forward to more recent archaeological work undertaken in the 21st century, we see that uh, there was a series of investigations done largely as part of the planning process. Um, so in 2004, a company called Arcus, which stands for Archaeological Research and Consultancy at the University of Sheffield, um, excavated some trial trenches. Now these are typically sort of two metre wide trenches that are uh, supposed to give us a sneak preview of, uh, of what the archaeology is. And uh, Arcus did those in 2004 and basically found some uh, shallow gullies, evidence of ditches. There was some Roman archaeology, but it appeared to be dropping off as you moved to the west. This was also confirmed in a, a similar, uh, similar exercise of evaluation trenching, or trial trenching, undertaken by Arcus' successor organisation, Arc Heritage. Again, a similar pattern emerged. Gullies, slight ditches, but it was, it was largely thought to be sort of fairly ephemeral archaeology with the archaeology dropping off as you move further to the west towards the shale quarry. Further work was also done in 2011 by Wessex Archaeology and again using the same methodologies Wessex basically confirmed what had been found by Arcus and Art Heritage previously and interpreted these as sort of Romano-British uh, field boundaries uh, associated with the Vicus. And it was this area that we then subsequently came to uh, excavate in uh, 2019 and 2020. So coming into 2019, off the back of the previous excavations that had been done, we had very low expectations of what we might actually find. Of course that changed rapidly as soon as we actually opened the ground, and then we found quite a lot. Uh, there was quite dense, quite complex archaeology with multiple phases evident from the outset and all of that was limited and defined at its northern end by a very large ditch. So the earliest phase of feature that we identified on site was primarily marked by a pair of curving ditches which came in from the east side and the north side of the site and they formed a little entrance between them uh, in the northeast corner. 
Uh, very interestingly, the ditch appears to have been filled in deliberately at the end of its use, and in the two terminals of the ditch there had been deposits placed which seemed to be closure deposits, um, a kind of a ceremonial thing. One of them was a ballista ball, that one there, which was on the western side in the terminal, and on the eastern side in the terminal we had a whole greyware pot. So the next phase of archaeology which we identified, which in places cut through that curving ditched enclosure, um, was a set of plot boundaries, and these were rectangular uh, ditches which had been laid out probably at the very first establishment of this settlement. Um, we found a secondary phase of these plot boundaries which was on top of them, and in places recut them, and in places changed those boundaries a little bit. To return to the large ditch which we had at the northern end of the site, um, that one the earliest phase of which we couldn't really determine. Um, it may have existed prior to the Roman occupation, but it's likely established when the Romans first move in. And it's a very large ditch, it's about eight metres wide, and it would have had a bank on its south side. You can see in one of these photos um, a collection of small stones which have been recovered, and those were the foundation for this bank. Uh, in the base of the ditch we had a selection of post holes which we could identify and these are the revetment for that bank um, on the south side. So the latest phase of Roman archaeology or possibly early sub-Roman archaeology that we identified in the 2019 excavations was probably the most exciting for us to dig and that was because it was the most substantial. Um, it was a uh, primarily a rectangular timber and stone construction of a, a building about uh, 8 metres by 7 metres in size and it probably had about two or three rooms in there. Um, the western end of it was a stone footing which appeared to have been robbed out and then there were multiple uh, timber subdivisions and beams and posts which would have made up the main structure of the building. Uh, that building interacted with a cob wall, or an earthen wall, to the south, which defined an area of yard space around it, and which also directed you towards a stone-paved sunken yard to the west of the building. So the stone-footed uh, and timber-framed building and the sunken stone yard which we've mentioned um, they were confined on their south side by a cob wall. Um, now a cob wall, for people who don't know, is effectively a, an earth or clay wall, uh, usually constructed on a stone foundation. And finding one of these, surviving in the Peak District, was quite a nice treat really. Um, we could see it had been quite heavily truncated, um, but over towards the east side of our site, it seemed to be surviving a lot better. We had a little bit of upstanding cob wall material, so we were quite determined to uh, follow that keenly into the 2020 area. So, obviously based on our excavation strategy in 2019, we understood that the levels of preservation were much higher than we'd originally anticipated. And so, going into 2020, it was required, and the 2020 area, of course, was underneath the tree screen, and that required a slightly different excavation approach. Now obviously, the tree screen had been planted, trees have roots, roots go down, and they can damage the archeology. span So what we did is we came with a bespoke methodology, working with the Peak District National Park, working with Breedens and their consultants, and what we did was we came up with a, a methodology so that each tree, the tree bowl, the tree roots, were individually plucked out of the ground, Archeo this would be under archaeological supervision. An archaeologist then went in and any finds were individually recorded to their original location so we could re reconstruct where they are. And we also used the tree bowls, the sides of them as well, if you like, the section to get a sneak preview of the sort of archaeology we were going to be going through. So having tweaked our methodology uh, and in 2020, having monitored the extraction of these, uh, of these tree roots, what we then did is we then went in with a, a, a small mechanical excavator and we stripped off in uh, spits of about 
10 centimetres, the topsoil, down to the very, very, very top of the archaeological horizon. However, as we were doing so, we also spatially recorded the location of each of the finds, as you'll see in the red flags, so that we could re locate or relate the location of the finds with the underlying archaeology, thus getting a, a, a better picture of, uh, of the use and disuse of the site as it goes through time. So the sequence of archaeology that we had on site in 2020, I'll just go through very quickly. Um, at the lowest level, we had our curving ditches, which we'd spotted in 2019. On top of that, we had our rectangular boundary ditches, which related to our establishing of the Vicus settlement. On top of that, we had uh, some recutting of those ditches. On top of that level, we had a layer of stake holes, which um, related to, we think, small animal pens within a larger open area. Uh, on top of that, we had our cob wall and some more stake holes, as well as uh, the extension of our building from 2019. And then above that level, we had a large deposit of accumulated earth, effectively. And that top level uh, sort of buried soil horizon is what we first came down onto when we started stripping. And it's characterised in particular by a layer of crushed flattened stones which have all been pressed into the top of that horizon and they seem to indicate that at that level there is a lot of activity going on there's a lot of movement and we think that is probably related to dismantling uh, or robbing of parts of the fort almost certainly post-roman um, but uh, out beyond that we don't know how late it might have been so uh, the curving ditched enclosure which we had in 2019 obviously continued into 2020 as we hoped it would and we got a lot more of it so we could see probably about three quarters of the enclosure we think um, we also saw as we excavated it evidence of internal banks for that enclosure which was really cool and within the sort of circular-ish enclosure we had a rectangular feature which uh, we think probably uh, represents a small building or possibly even some kind of sub-enclosure with a palisade, uh, which is really interesting. Again, all of this, we think, is the earliest phase of features on site, and that is evidenced by uh, the south end of the enclosure being covered over by a stone-paved yard, which relates to a continuation of our building from 2019, which we'll start to show you now. Here on the edge of this area where we've had quite a lot of stone coming up, um, what do you reckon? What do I think? Yeah. I think that you've got the truncated remains of what looks to be a, a late building. Mm. So if you take this line here to give you a southern wall, and then over where James is, we're moving towards the northern wall, and then just behind James, it looks very much as though we've got two phases of external surface, but interestingly, no wall here. Mm. And I suspect what we're moving into here is you can see these stones tipping into something, tipping into something deeper. What I suspect we've got here is a wear hollow that's associated where, with where people are moving in and out of this building. So if you like, the building is open-ended at this mm. side or with the door. And then if you can just see over there, we have this flat, I mean, it's all disturbed. It's been yeah. buried for 2000 years, but we have this flat laid slab, some of which we also got last year, which is strongly indicative of actually still having, of having in situ flooring. Um, I believe we've also found part of what may be a lead curse uh, uh, in some of that. So that's all really quite interesting, as well as pottery out of the bottom of this wear hollow mm. that looks as though it's primary breakage. Absolutely. So it really does look as though we're starting to tickle the very top of the sequence of disuse of a late Roman building inside this Vicus, and that is really exciting. Continuing on from the uh, 2019 building that we had, as we went further east and saw more of it, um, we came to realise that there was something a little bit strange going on. While we did appear to have a continuation of the building, um, it was a lot more ephemeral. There were large spreads of stone which appeared to relate to the structure, and we think they're probably beam pads, um, but they weren't really very well formed. They'd all been very badly truncated, and the entire area of our continued structure just looked less well put together. Um, 
what we think it probably represents is a, a sort of a more of a temporary structure, a bit of a lean-to on the east side of our more well-established stone and timber building, which we had in 2019. Uh, within that area, we had a, a stone oven base, which was really nice, and um, the area itself opened up at the back and appeared to lead straight out uh, into an open yard area to the north, east and south. And that yard area was confined at the south side by our cob wall and contained a stone lined cistern type feature. Uh, we don't think it's a well because the water there is incredibly acidic and the actual shaft didn't go deep enough to draw water. Uh, on the north side of the building, our yard there was stone paved and much more substantial, so we think that was probably more of a loading, unloading area uh, for goods coming over from the fort. Generally, the whole thing in 2020 we've found to have more of a sort of industrial kind of character, so whether we've got a workshop on the back of a dwelling or whether the entire building would have been some kind of industrial space, we're not quite sure at the moment. So the cob wall which we had in 2019 did continue into our excavation in 2020 and it was really nice. It was uh, quite well preserved. We had it standing to a height of in places about 20 centimetres which was pretty good considering the ploughing that had happened elsewhere on site. And it was significant because this kind of earthen architecture really doesn't survive um, or, or really get picked up a lot in rural archaeology in Britain in particular. So finding it in this kind of state of preservation on site was really special. Um, it fit into the sequence uh, fairly late really, so it relates largely to the building which we had to the north and some spreads of stake holes which were around the cob wall at its southeast side. Uh, it was post-dated by a build-up of uh, soil and buried ground which we had as a later thing to do with the dismantling of the fort and it post dates itself uh, all of the boundary ditches and plot boundaries which were established as part of the Vicus settlement. So Ruben we've got a selection of finds here from Hope Excavations can you let us know what we're looking at? Yeah of course um... One of the things that blows my mind about the presence of a, uh, of a Roman fort within the Hope Valley itself is that actually what we, what we think of as being a backwater, the Hope Valley, was intimately incorporated and probably into the world's first globalised economy, economy, sort of in the late first century AD and through into the second century AD. And this is evidence no better than uh, some of the finds that we've got here. So. This here is an amphora specifically for uh, taking fish sauce, rotted fish sauce called garum. And this was produced in Spain in the first century BC and first century AD. Food, product, food, food storage. And then here you'll see we've got part of a small Samian cup. That's lovely. Better yeah. known as terra sigillata, really. And these are, these are product, products from France up until the mid second century. You see here we've got part of the base of a a platter or a dish mm. like this and then here in the same sort of fabric or the same sort of type of pottery we've got something called a, a flange bowl it would have originally had a, a flange here uh, and again so if you look here these are all about these things here are about tableware so mm. food storage food preparation and mortaria tableware is here and then uh, a locally produced, so it's 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 from the south of England actually. Uh, part of a dish here with uh, lattice work on the outside. So that's just to give you a that's just to give you a a, a sense that you've got so you've got goods coming in into part of the Hope Valley. Pro I mean, with the military, but there was a, there was a later supply. You've got you've got goods coming into the Hope Valley from what would have been then, you know, exotic shores. Okay, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed, we hope you've enjoyed, the last 20 or so minutes and have found what we've been talking about as interesting and as inspiring as we found it to be part of this project. Um, obviously, all archaeological projects are collective joint ventures and none more so or less so than this work. So we've just got a few thank yous to say first. Now, 
obviously within the Peak District National Park, we need to thank very much Natalie Ward, who's Chief Conservation Archaeologist at the uh, Peak District National Park. We'd also very much like to thank Breedens as an organisation for supporting us in this work, but in particular two members of staff, Keith Rowland, who's the manager of the Shale Quarry and who's supported us through the entire process, and Chris Ashton, who was our machine driver and who generally supported everything we did on site. So a special thank you to both of you. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of the volunteers who came on site during 2019, a different time to be certain. They were all fantastic and we had over 68 of them over the summer period. Um, so thank you very much to all of you. And lastly, we'd like to thank our dedicated staff at ARS, who, without which this project wouldn't have been possible. So without further ado, it's good night from me and it's good night from him. Good night. Good night. People have reported problems with sort of the connection or buffering. Um, the whole session is recorded and links will be sent out, so you should be able to see the the, the full video when you, when you get the links. Um, it's a really amazing project, and um, you know we've got the sequence, we've got the start of the story, but as I think Richard's talk about medieval Derby illustrated earlier on, that post excavation is is so key, and we're kind of we're only at the tip of the iceberg of what are we going to find out, aren't we? Um, Anna, have we got any questions for uh, Tom and Ruben? On we have. I'm just sorting them. I think you've flummoxed them with all those beautiful finds. Um, we've got, <laughs> firstly, well, an observation, really, just that it's really interesting to see pottery from the continent making its way to the Hope Valley all those centuries ago. So um, that's a nice observation. Uh, there's a question around... The footpath. I was wondering if the fact that a public footpath runs through the site has encouraged interference with the remains. Is that something you're aware of? Um, well, it, it doesn't run through the through the area that we excavated. It runs through the area of the scheduled ancient monument, and uh, uh, um, we've had people peering over the fence asking what we were doing, but largely. Um, no, there's not been any interference on site, though I think we chased a couple of detectorists off the scheduled monument a year ago. We've had lots of positive comments saying, lovely video, thank you so much for putting that together. Someone has made an observation about the pottery. Um, it looks exceptionally abraded. Was that the ground conditions or suggestive of disturbed contexts? I think it's a mixture of the two. I'm going out on a bit of a limb here, having uh, worked there for a bit, but I think the stuff where you see it's really, really, really sort of been um, abraded and uh, uh, that seems to be the Lamarta de Versamian, not the Lamarta de Versamian, yeah, the Lamarta Samian, and that seems to be being attacked by the acidity in the soil. Whereas you see the other stuff, you see the, there was the base with a little bit of the stamp on it, that's from the zoo and seems to be much more resilient to the ground conditions. That's probably a bit more information than you needed, really. So yes, the answer is yes. It did. It did attrition. It did affect the finds. The soil yeah. conditions. Yeah. Okay. Did. Thank you. That's really interesting. Sorry, I've got quite a few things coming in. Um, this is an observation. I wonder why the yeah. Romans were so keen on garum. By all accounts, it was awful. So, <laughs> don't know what you think about that. <laughs> well, let's draw the equivalent with marmite. I can tell. Or broccoli. Yeah, Marmite. Let's, let's call it Marmite. B 
Bill says, what did the Romans ever do for hope? <laughs> but um, more, more poignantly for your site, very particularly, the cob wall was obviously a very extraordinary, exciting find. Is this the earliest known surviving cob wall in the UK? Uh, no, I don't think so. There, there will be the earlier ones surviving in London and in uh, and in Colchester. But when I say earlier, I'm probably meaning, you know, 30 years earlier, that sort of thing. But um, I'm sure there's preservation of cob walls in, uh, or certainly urban architecture, in uh, waterlogged conditions uh, and, you know, prehistoric urban architecture. I'm sure there is. Uh, we were just surprised to find it, and in fact, um, didn't believe it at first, yeah. you know. But then the strat the stratification just demonstrated unequivocally, you know, what was going on with it, really. And, and even to the point where we were cleaning it back, and you could actually see the individual lifts of where they put the soil down and stamped it down, and then gone again. And there's one of the slides Tom showed where you could see the sort of this this sort of horizontal mm. banding, uh, you know. Uh, over the tops of the walls, so it was quite um, it was quite a revelation to find urban architecture in uh, that sort of context. So really, it's something for all the archaeologists out there digging holes in Derbyshire to be looking out for. Really, I've um, just put your slides up if you want to go through and refer to any of the stills. They're there for okay. you guys to talk to if you want to go back to anything. Okay. So we've got a couple more questions in. Um, could you explain the link with the quarry a bit more clearly? And the question is, are they extending into the site? Do you want me to take it? Yeah, you want that one. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the excavations happened because the shale quarry is extending, but it's only extending within its existing mineral permission. Um, so that band of trees that were planted is as far is as far as they've got permission to go. So yes, it is extending, but only where they've got permission to extend already. I hope that answers the question. I did have a question actually about that band of trees, saying it's curious that that was even permitted so close to the scheduled monument. I think a different decision would probably be made now. We have different evidence now, and that was quite some time ago, wasn't it? Sort of in the seventies and eighties, I think those were planted. Yes, in the, I mean, there's, in the absence of statutory protection. Yeah, exactly. So it, we would make a, a different decision. Is would be made now, but it's a good observation. Mm -hmm. Someone has asked. They were planted to. Um, sorry, Anna. They were planted to screen the the quarry workings as well. You know, that's that's one of the reasons why they're there. So you're not stood on the fort or over in Bruff, and there's a great big working quarry next to you. They they provide some protection and screening for that. Thank you. I think there's an important an important point to make as well in that you know um i'm a firm believer and we are at ars that all archaeology is research and without that tree screen and without the extension of the quarry there'd be none of the additions to knowledge so it's that it's that it's that balancing act isn't it so we we've actually got now knowledge gains tangible knowledge gains that we think will help rewrite the history of the site thank you um there's a question about the balls so what were the balls that were shown your ballista balls i think that for some people um didn't catch that in the video so if you could explain what the the ballista balls are please yeah. so yes those round stone balls that were on the table are ballista balls um and they would have been fired by the ballista you know the big roman crossbow shaped catapult effectively um, they would have been able to fire bolts, all balls, most of them, um, but bolts are hard to make and balls are fairly easy to make comparatively. You don't need to cast anything, you just need a chisel and some stone. Um, and in answer to, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip ahead and answer Patrick's question because it relates. The ballista balls we have are made of millstone grit, so they are local stone. Thank you. So you've captured two in one there that's great we've had a question about glass and there was um, a University of Sheffield and Castleton Historical Society dig on the um, other side of the road where they did find some glass and the question is was any found on this site that you were excavating there was yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah. 
we had a fairly small amount of glass, but we did have some on site and it was mixed in amongst the assemblages of um, learning tableware and imported pottery. And it all points to that relatively high status. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. And I think the last one, because I'm mindful of the time, um, in what way was hope important to the Romans? Mm. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, you, you think of the transport link, so it acts as a noble point in, in so many ways. It's also, a, you know, a forward base. So you, it's the widest part of the Hope Valley. So you're controlling access up through going up north and across going from east to west so you've got if you like the roman connections from um sheffield and uh Templebury going over towards buxton and you've also got them coming across from chesterfield um uh, you've got putative line potentially of a, of a roadway that uh, you know comes up the hope valley and drops down near habersage and a lot of it is controlling access up towards uh, Melandra to the north, but also, um, you know, the presence of the Romans and the antiquity of the lead industry uh, in, in this part of Derbyshire on the limestone plateau. Well, I mean, we know of Roman uh, Roman mines in the in in the locality, so um, maybe uh, maybe Navio's where it is as well to also uh, control uh, the supply of lead coming out of uh, out of this part of Derbyshire. Lovely. Thank you. I think we'll have to leave it there for questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much both for the video and for answering the questions. Um, and we'll definitely like to have you back for future Archaeology Days when you start getting the information out the post text to wow us some more with your findings out of, out of Hope and out of Navio. Yes, please do, Tom. Because there was, um, there was obviously a small amount of people who had a bit of internet trouble or maybe laptop trouble with the sound and stuff um and someone has asked if the video will be made available elsewhere it is our plan in in the next couple of months i hope to to make that available uh, more widely great thanks tom thanks very much so anna over to you thank you very much i shall just try and make myself appear we're slightly running over time. I hope you can bear with us just for a couple more minutes. Um, thank you so much to all our speakers. Natalie will close us off afterwards. I've just got a couple of notices to um, make. So I'm just going to load my short notices. Some of you have asked about this in the chat already. Acid Magazine is available, it has been printed. We've obviously struggled to distribute it in the normal way this year because of COVID. It's available digitally, so you can search for that on the Peak District National Park website. You can also um, request a free copy in the post. There are a limited number, um, so that's on a first come, first serve basis from the Visit Chesterfield website. So the information is there. I'll pop a handout up in just a moment, which is a PDF you can download and all the links will be in there as well. I just wanted to alert you to a really lovely art project that we're involved with at the moment called Guideline. It's being led by Glassball um, Arts Collective and it's looking at the, or portion of the Peak District National Park boundary in our 70th year we're sort of celebrating the boundary and doing a critical examination of that and what the boundary means and so glass ball are keen to collect um, stories ideas contributions to that so the website is guideline.org.uk again the link will be in the handout that's a lovely project and finally, just to say another big thank you to those of you who have already donated to the fundraising campaign for repairs to Bateman's tomb. Thank you if you haven't already and you'd like to. Uh, the website address is on the bottom there. I realise it's long. So again, the link will be in the handout. We're very grateful um, and we're hoping that those repairs can be carried out by the parish this year in the 200th. 
anniversary year of Bateman's birth. So I will stop sharing those slides. I will put myself back on and hand over to you, Natalie. And in the meantime, I'll also put the handout back up. So just to bring everything to a close for today, I want to um, first thank all our speakers for, for joining us online and um, talking us through their projects and their findings. And a thanks to all their, um, their colleagues and their friends and their funders that have helped make these projects possible. Um, a huge thank you to all of you for attending today um, and bearing with us as we all try this, this new experience of virtual, virtual archaeology day. Um, and thank you to everyone who's donated so far to our Bateman's Tomb Conservation Fund. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to part two tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and hope to see as many of you there as possible. We'll see you tomorrow. Stay safe.